Ouse. Mm-hmm. By the people in the hallway. Oh, yes. Well, I needed it to know who y'all was anyway. Where's the panelist list? Right here. Meanwhile, she just added you guys. What's your name? Some good people. Okay. <laughs> Drea. Okay. Yes, sir.
All right, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Let's clap it up. We're in another room. Now, I am not leading this panel. I'm just introducing your phone turned off again. I'm just introducing the panel uh, and its moderator. So to moderate, well, no, I'll do that last. Uh, so from my right, this is y'all left, uh, Ron, who is an artivist, as we call them. So if y'all don't know what artivism is, artivism is a different form of activism. It is activism through the arts. A lot of people don't know what that is. We have very many musical people. We have many actual artists. We have fashion designers. There's different ways and forms of doing activism. Ron is an artivist. He does art, he does paintings. Uh, he even had an exhibit one time, uh, I believe at the House of Justice, am I right? Uh, he is a Long Islander. Um, so us city folks are not used to Long Islanders. So y'all have to bear with us on today. Then um, also I have Mr. Steven. Okay, I'm glad I, that's okay. Steven uh, Cheek Fernandez, who, check, sorry. Check Fernandez, who is a visual artist and multimedia journalist. Journalism is also part of activism. If you are a journalist, you are helping to promote and spread the word about the things that are going on. A lot of times people don't notice that if it wasn't for journalists, we wouldn't know half of the things that are happening. Yesterday, if you watched the documentary on Reverend Sharpton, you noticed, and I'm not taking over your panel, but uh, you noticed that um, the young lady that recorded the George Floyd um, killing, it was so profound because they had a segment of her and how Rev was helping to defend her because she was being attacked for just recording a video. But that video, that eight minutes and 40-something seconds, is what allowed the rest of the world to understand the injustices that black people face here in America. And we are grateful even to this day for her even having the courage. Because, you know, some people record just to record. Mm -hmm. But other people record because of courage. Mm -hmm. And that is what Mr. Stephen, uh, Mr. Stephen is here for on today. Then next to him is Miss Yvonne. Miss Yvonne is from the Harlem Fashion Week. Any Harlemites in the house? All right, Harlem in the house. She is a part of the Harlem Fashion Week. Harlem Fashion Week is awesome. Last year, I believe I did a virtual panel with um, Harlem Fashion Week, and it was good. We talked about the dangers of social media. Uh, but she is a good example of how we use activism through fashion. Do we have any fashionable people in here? Any divas? All right, I see Tatiana I just, all over you. Yes, and so she's good with that and with fashion. Then to her left is Charisma, Charisma J, an award-winning performing artist. Uh, a dough, uh, how do you say it, a bun? A bun. Abundance Academy of the Arts. She is the CEO, and I'm here for some ab uh, abundance today. Oh yes, I'm coming ready for the abundance. And then last but not least, we have Miss Jasmine. Ashley. Ashley, Ashley, another Ashley. We got two Ashleys on the panel, double Ashley. That's double trouble. Oh my. Uh, and she is going to tell you more about what she does. Um, but um, there are just so many great people on the panel. And then last but not least, is a very good artivist who is in charge of our fashion show and talent show this afternoon. I told y'all, 5 o'clock, we start in sharp, sharp 10. Um, but Ashley Sharpton is the daughter of Reverend Sharpton. She's also the founder of the NAN Youth Huddle and Sharpton Entertainment, uh, which helps and does all of the things like that. She also does all of Rev's and NAN's social media along with JT. So if anything you see with uh, social media and stuff like that, that is Ashley. She is also an artivist. And so that is a different form. Rev is the preacher. Ashley likes to be behind scene with the pictures. So that's a different P. But let's welcome our uh, moderator, Ashley, and then our panelists as they're coming forth. Thank you. Thank you, Christian Matthew. Let's clap up Christian Matthew. He's an incredible young leader. All right, let's get started. We, first of all, I apologize to our panelists because we're starting late. Uh, our elders, measuring the, of the movement, went over this morning, and they, you know, 
but it was a great, great time. So salute to y'all. We love y'all. Uh, we couldn't do this without you. We stand on great shoulders. I must salute our EVP in the room, Attorney Michael Hardy. We would not be the National Action Network without him. I see brother Dr. Jamal Watson, who's telling the story, who helps to shape the narrative, and who's helped us keep this going for a long time. And it's good to see you all here, Trey, who's been a longtime member and leader of Names Youth Huddle, and he's going on to do great things. Um, but I'll get started. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, so Christian introduced me, but he doesn't know. Um, so 15 years ago, we started Artivism here with the National Action Network with the Fashion and Talent Showcase that we were having tonight. This is our 15th annual showcase. And before that, I didn't really hear about that word in our sphere. So I, I feel like we introduced Artivism to the National Action Network movement. So let's clap us up. Okay. And I've had a ple the pleasure with everybody on this panel um, of working with them in their, in their art, honestly. And it was an honor to convene you all. And even though someone was last minute, y'all answered the call. And I appreciate that family. <laughs> all right. All right, so let's get started. Um, she do you guys want to introduce yourselves or did she go to your job? Okay, Ashley, let's start with you. This is Ashley Jackson. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ashley Jackson. It's very nice to be here with you all. I've had such a wonderful time at NAN. It's my first NAN conference, yes. so thank you so much for having me. Um, I have been acting since about 2017. My first film was Beats on Netflix, um, starring myself, Anthony Anderson, Uzo Aduba, and then from there, I was also in college at the same time, so it was a lot navigating the, the student life at Spelman and also acting, and then I transitioned into writing during the pandemic and also now producing because I'd like to have my own production company to act and write in the things that I create that are for our people. Excellent. Charisma J. This is so surreal. Me and Ashley went to school together since we were three years old. We Literally. were in the Invogets, and Mama Kathy used to make our costumes to perform at Cotton Club. Okay, right. so I'm I'm like That's amazed true. to be here. That's okay, true. and all of you and all that you have been able to just evolve into. Mm -hmm. So shout out to you, Ashley Shepton. Period. Okay, I am Charisma J. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I am the artistic director and founder of Brooklyn in the House. Period. <laughs> period. <laughs> I am the Executive Artistic Director and Founder of Abundance Academy of the Arts. Yes, Abundance, the D is capitalized for flair, as you can see from my braids and my things, okay? We have actually been able to provide access to arts. We like to say that we are providing access to abundance and we all deserve abundance. We deserve an abundance of soft life. We deserve an abundance of access to wellness and healing and dance is our foundation because in the word abundance there is dance. But we really teach about life skills. I used to say that we have uh, uh, clients that are from ages two to 82 and then my great grandmother before she passed away at 98 was taking class so it's age two to 102. We have classes for everyone in dance, in wellness, but also in just what is what it means to 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 be embraced and have a safe haven for yourself and your community. Thank you, Charisma. The one and only Yvonne Junell of Harlem Fashion Week. Oh my gosh! So I'm super happy to be here today, Ashley. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, as a Harlemite, uh, I remember growing up actually seeing Ashley produce the Sharps and shows. Mm -hmm. And the ad, in front of the Adam Clayton Powell State yes. Office mm -hmm. building, she was like, "Come on, you gotta, you gotta put yourself on the runway yeah. too." Years later, my mom and I, who's right there in the front, um, produced a company called Harlem Fashion Week. We wanted to make sure that we cultivated the next opportunity of emerging designers. We expanded that more to doing uh, business and fashion symposiums with Chase Bank. We did other opportunities where we called it a fashion with a message, giving designers an opportunity to not only just design a beautiful garment on the runway, but also design something with a message. So Ashley was a part of that panel where we had actually a Stop the Violence campaign That's where right. designers created garments that were actually inspired by their own kind of response to what was going on in our world and our community. We continue to do that as we develop our nonprofit program where we work with young people to now teach the new generation, the younger folks, how to get ready for the fashion industry. Thank you for having me. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> Steven Check. he's one of the most amazing designers I've ever seen. What you create is incredible. Um, how you doing? First and foremost, I'd like to say thank you, God, and um, thank you for everybody for coming today. Um, I'm a, that's right. I'm an actor, artist, clothing designer. I worked with uh, Ashley before on Harlem Week mm -hmm. with Her Games 2. We designed some clothes for the children and um, pretty much giving a pathway for the future generations to just to you know speak their mind and the creativity and come out their shell because I was once a uh, you know, like a shy little boy, 
just like anybody else, and we have to break through those you know, barriers. And here I am today speaking to all of you, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Chet. And last but not least, our current artivist at the National Action Network and the lead organizer. Anybody have ever joined us for DEI Thursdays over the last three months? Yeah. All right, all right. This is our organizer and leader, Brother Ron McHenry. There wasn't a lot of hands that went up. Right, we need more of y'all. So yeah, I just want to say this. Every DEI Thursday, come out in front of Bill Ackman's off, uh, office. Bill Ackman is uh, against DEI, which is our rights. We all benefit from it. We're trying to keep it in place. We know that the Supreme Court is breaking down our rights that we gained in the 60s. We got to fight back. If you're an artivist, fight back. Mm -hmm. If you're a lay person, fight back. Fight back what, what you have. Oh, that fight back came out strong. <laughs> but yeah, there weren't enough hands that went up. And if you, uh, if you have time from the time of 12 to 1 on Thursdays, come out. It's, it's happening here, but we're going to do it throughout the country. My name is Ronald McHenry. I'm a minister. I'm an artist. I'm an educator. Uh, I'm currently the coordinator at the House of Justice for the National Action Network. And I first want to give honor to our founder, Dr. Reverend Al Sharpton. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> to Attorney Hardy, who's his right hand, who's in the back. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> to everyone that's on this panel, I greet you. And I, I just also want to give thanks to God, who is my therapist, my best friend. He's my all in all. And uh, if you don't know him, you know, I, I encourage you to get to know him. I got into art because of all the stuff that was going on around me as a kid, and, and art was that way for me to channel mm -hmm. a lot that was going on. It was, it was that way for me to give a message without having the words to be able to put it together. They say a picture tells a thousand words, so even though uh, I wasn't into Dr. Seuss, I drew my own pictures on Dr. Seuss. Right. I couldn't identify with some of the books they gave me in school, so I began to draw my own narrative. Mm. And so art has always been a tool of power, especially in this time, which has woken up my artivism is seeing our rights being eroded by the Supreme Court, uh, especially with voting rights, I decided to create a collection uh, called The Movement of Faith that talked about how it is not just, uh, it is not by coincidence that we gained our rights, it's through us collectively coming together spiritually and having a cause bringing us together. A lot of times people won't come to get out to church or they won't come to hear a sermon. But you need, we need to differentiate the message. So I did that through my art. And uh, here I am today with you all to talk about artivism. All right. Well, you already started answering my first question, Brother Ron. The first question is, how do you use art as a tool for social, for social justice? So you can start since you already began. Uh, how do you use art as a tool for social justice? Well, if you think about the history of art, specifically in this country, right? Think about the Harlem Renaissance. The Harlem Renaissance was a, a time during the Great Migration after World War I uh, where folks came up, up, down, up from the South for better opportunities and they settled into, into the North for, for better opportunities in, in places like Chicago and, and so forth. But Harlem really became the Mecca and the home uh, where most people felt comfortable. Now, the thing about the Harlem Renaissance, a lot of us don't know what the word Renaissance means. Renaissance actually means, and for my church folk, this is where you get your breakthrough. Don't miss out your shout. <laughs> Renaissance means revival. Renaissance, yeah, you missed your shout. It actually <laughs> means resurrection. So in Harlem, W.E.D. E. Du Bois at the time, who was, a, who was a huge activist, who was the uh, editor of the NAACP uh, newspaper that called The Crisis, that it went out monthly, uh, decided to get poets involved and they were, they were beginning to retell the story that blackface and all kinds of American imagery was putting out on us. So the point of artivism is to shift the conversation. America, that we are not the image that you put up on the screen. We could speak correctly. We're well-educated. We're artists. We're thinkers. And we're much more. We built this country. We raised your children. We got out of slavery not because of what you did for us, but because we saved this country. And we continue to make the sacrifice, and it was through art that we began to change the narrative and to the point where whites started, they didn't want us to come into that, their town, but they started coming into ours. To, 
to listen to jazz music, to partake in the festivities. And so art continues to be that vehicle. Okay, thank you. Anybody else want to answer that question? Huh? Ashley? Yeah, I would just like to step in even when you're talking about narratives. When cinema was first founded and invented in Europe and in America, African Americans were coming out of enslavement, some were still enslaved, and so we were already set back in terms of the ways that we were able to show up for ourselves in representation. We had issues with tropes and stereotypes that still last to this day, and so by entering the entertainment industry through film and television for me, acting, um, using that art as a platform for social justice just by showing up for my ancestors who did not have the chance to represent themselves and what it means to young black children to be able to see themselves. I know that I have been forever changed by the content that I've seen and just to be able to give that to future generations I think is inherently political, socially just and something that we need to consider in terms of the messages that we're consuming um, uh, uh, in platforms of cinema today. Well said, thank you Ashley. <laughs> Charisma. So, so my foundation is rooted in dance, and a lot of times, especially as a Afro-Latina, I had curly hair, I had thick thighs, I had a booty, I had all the curves, and it was very difficult to be in this technical world of dance where I didn't look like the person that we were supposed to be admiring. I didn't have the skin tone of the person or the hair texture of the person, and so for me, especially now as I've been not only dancing, but now in dance education, I enter spaces, supremely white spaces, and I allow for, right, I allow for there to be more conversation around what true equity, what true inclusion looks like in dance. And sometimes it's about body shaming, and we spend time really identifying how to allow for body positivity and body inclusivity. Sometimes it's about hair texture, because quite often people might think putting your hair in a bun is an easy task, but it's not an easy task. And for black and brown children, for black and brown dancers, there's a whole way that putting your hair in a bun could trigger trauma, because you have hair trauma. Your hair might be too short, too curly, it might not fit into a bun or stay into a bun. We all know if there's humidity, if you try to straighten your hair and humidity is around, your hair is not gonna stay in that bun. So there are a lot of ways that I try with my efforts as I'm in the Juilliard School or at Hunter College teaching dance. There are ways that we don't even start the dance class without talking about the history of all that has occurred prior to mm. us dancing. Because why not take that time out? Because if we don't, take that time out then to that point about narratives, it's gonna get in somebody else's hands. Mm. It's going, the, the authority on the information is going to get into somebody else's hands and that person is not gonna be telling the whole story. So for me, any dance class I teach in terms of how do I use my art, any dance class I teach, we start sitting down and we start in a circle and we start talking about the history of dance because a lot of people do not give credit to Africa where dance started. That's right. A lot of times they'll say that the foundation of dance is ballet and I love me some ballet, take it every Tuesday and Thursday. However, the foundation of dance is in the foundation of the people and we all know that the first person we found historically, scientifically, was in Africa. Mm. So let's go back to get what is ours to know where we come from so that we know where we're going. Right? Well All right, I want to, I'm sorry if somebody else want to answer that question, but you got me on something, Charisma. You started talking about history. And of course, we're, we're fighting one of the biggest issues as NAN all around the country. We're trying to protect black history um, and save the curriculums. So how can those of you who are teachers, and I think all of you work with children, um, how can teachers incorporate social justice themes into their curriculum? Mm -hmm. if, they're, um, if they're blocking it and making it illegal, how can they do that through art? I think the biggest thing is thinking about art as solving a problem. As artists, we use our art, whatever medium it is, whether it be dance, whether it be visual art, whether it be through fashion design, to actually solve a problem. So when, we, when I talk with designers and I have those conversations, I say, what problem are you solving? Mm in the world, what exactly, how can you touch someone with your art? It's not just a blazer for a blazer's sake or a beautiful t-shirt or graphic design, but now what message can you infuse into your collection that's going to then um, chain an emotional response to someone, allow them to feel love, allow them to feel safe, allow them to feel some type of comfort. A lot of designers started to create things that were not just, okay, we understand the functional part of clothing, but now let's tap into something deeper. So I think that as creatives, and a lot of you guys in the audience may be artists or think thinking about different things, how can I also provoke change and what people are wearing because it is a form of communication. Mm -hmm.
I definitely want to um, bounce on that. I, I feel the same way. I created change because of uh, the opportunities I was rejected for. I'm an artist, I'm an actor, and there's a lot of doors closed in my face. So I started creating my own doors. Mm -hmm. And me being a father of a beautiful daughter sitting over there, mm -hmm. I wanted to give her more opportunities that I can create and she can witness her for herself so that she could create her own future. Something that you know I, I, I wasn't privileged to, to see. So in uh, 2015, I started a TV show with uh, a director named Bobby Ashley, and it was filmed in Brooklyn, New York. We had over 30 million streaming views, and the show was picked up. This neighborhood was so bad. They used to have drugs being sold every day. Fights were breaking out. But when we came there and we filmed the TV show, the neighborhood took notice. People started to come out their house, and they started to feel that they can too do it. So, you know, they, everybody has a story to tell. So they started recording. Before you know it, news stations started coming to the neighborhood, interviewing us. And we really made a change within that community. You know, it just brought people to, you know, realize we can be more than what we were shown or we, what we was taught before. And um, basically, I created a clothing line called Truck and Flyway. In 2019, we started our first fashion show. It, it was called Push the Horizon, pushing the limits and breaking the rules of fashion to express yourself. So my daughter was my main priority in this, and uh, she got to see what it feels like when a door is open, you know. And I gave many other children the opportunity to self. And after that, we started creating more fashion shows with a message. In 2020, in 2020, we created the new normal, Black Lives Matter. In 2022, we created the optimistic hustle. So some of the street people could understand what it feels like to be optimistic and believe there can be change. Thank you. So as an educator, often I would infuse black history. I taught science for 14 years. And if I was teaching about DNA, I would talk about Henry Lacks. Henry Lacks, if you don't know, they, they've made a billion dollar industry off her cells because mm -hmm. the way they replicate in their lifespan, and they've been able to develop all kinds of vaccines. And they did all of this and made all of this money without her family knowing, right? And so right now they're in court fighting with Benjamin Crump. I, I, I talked, uh, talked about the exonerated five, and Corey Weiss is in the house, everybody put your hand together Corey. for Corey Weiss. And I've talked about how they use the DNA, uh, right, from that, from the actual case to uh, pin it towards a guy that bragged about that he was the one that did it in jail. And so I've always infused our story mm -hmm. in, into the curriculum, but you have to go, you have to do that, you have to know the history to be able to infuse it. Yeah. There's no curriculum out there that has it. So you basically, and it's not enough to have a, a black character you know, we, we, go, growing up, they had the magic school bus, and you, you see all these characters, and they put a black character in. It's not enough. That doesn't tell us enough, right? Yes, yeah, sure, it's great to have representation, but our history continues to be left out. So as educators, we have to educate ourselves first on the history and then figure out how to backwards design it into our lessons and so that it becomes part of the day-to-day. -day. Well, now they're outlawing black history. So what do you do about that as an educator? So I can't teach history. I can't necessarily get up if it was banned mm -hmm. to talk about Corey Wise's story, but the kids can. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Come on, come on. Yeah. You missed your shout. Come on. <laughs> I got you it. missed I your it. shout. If you are at home teaching your kids about black history, if the church is doing its job teaching about black history, no institution can stop a student from talking about their history. That's right. So if projects are given that allow students to express their culture, no matter where they came from, if it's Europe, if it be Europe, or if it be the Caribbean, whatever, the, if you allow students for it to be about them and not you, first you will have more engagement in the classroom, and then number two, students will take ownership of their learning and teach each other instead of the burden being on you. So the answer is 
to allow students' culture to come alive by giving them the opportunity to talk about themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Ron. You know, I had, I had a student who found out on TikTok about Mansa Musa. Mm. And if you don't know who Mansa Musa was, he is to date the richest man in the world. That's right. To date. He, was a black he man. had the Malian Empire. He was from Mali, West Africa. And, you know, TikTok is how <laughs> this particular student had found out. Not, not the history book, not McGraw Hill, but TikTok, right? And so what I have tried to do with my art is find the ways that we can be culturally responsive to where the students are. Like if I'm teaching a ballet class, I'll put on a song that they like so that when I'm teaching them to plie, they actually can identify with the music and not reject this European aesthetic or this European art form or this European ideal because they think it's not something that they should like because it's to classical music. So there are ways that we can kind of really weave in that cultural responsibility to continue to make access because right off the bat, we, when we don't know something, we reject it. It's, and that's natural, it's organic. Like, oh, I don't know about that. And so if we, as educators, as community leaders, as moms, as dads, if we can actually just create more of a bridge by checking into the TikTok of it all, sometimes, you know, like for some of my students, I started making TikToks with them because I saw that they needed to feel safe enough to express themselves. They also needed to be a little bit more full out with their moves because TikTok is very tiny with their moves, but that's the dancer in me, okay. And so in trying to relate to them, I noticed they're always on social media. So what could I do to bridge that gap, get on social media with them? And that created another level of, in, in, in some regard, intimacy. Like we got closer because I was able to meet them where they are. And now when it comes to them feeling safe about talking about things that are going on at school, it's a no brainer because they feel like somebody heard them or saw them and connected to them in a deep way. All right, this one is for my activists on the panel. How can art be used to challenge and dismantle systems of oppression. Anyone? Okay, you're looking at me. So. <laughs> yeah. Our current organizer. <laughs> so the question is how can art be used to break systems of oppression? Mm -hmm. Part of it is art has always been used to break systems of oppression. That was an easy answer. Yeah. Uh, National Action Network is a faith-based organization and we don't apologize for that. So I'm gonna get straight into the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, if you open up to the 31st chapter, it talks about a character named Basilel. People looking at me with a, with a question mark. Not a lot of Bible readers in here. But Basilel was important because he is the one who built the tent of meetings. He's the one who actually constructed the clothes for the priests. He's the one, right? We talk about the Ten Commandments. Well, where did the Ten Commandments be, were? They were actually put into the Ark of Covenant that was constructed by Bezalel. He's the first artist in the Bible. He was the only, he is the person, check this out, or for my Holy Ghost people, he's the first person in the Bible recorded to be filled with the Spirit. Preacher. <laughs> it wasn't Moses, it wasn't Adam, it, the first person recorded in the Bible to be filled with the Spirit of God was Bezalel. Moses had a problem because God gave him all these tasks that he couldn't do. And he said, I put my spirit into this man named Basilel. Mm. And it wasn't for him to go out and preach because that's what Moses and Aaron was doing. It was for him to get into artivism. Mm. Come on. Because the first thing that happens when you bring a people out of captivity is you have to now reform them in a new culture. Mm -hmm. And the way you shift the culture is through the art. There's another story. David and Goliath. We all know the story. Israel is being oppressed by this big giant. And they're like, look at his shield. Look at his, his breastplate. Oh, he's been fighting since he's seven years old. Oh, he's 10 foot tall. The, 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 he, and, and, and the challenge was, if anybody could defeat me, we, we'll leave you alone. 
And this young shepherd boy was coming to do an errand for his father to give provisions to his brothers. And the Bible says that he stood up when everyone was sitting down and said, I will make of this giant the same that I did to the bears and the lions of the field. And they brought this man to the king, this, this, this young boy, who was a musician, by the way. And the king said, you must be crazy. He said, I fought bears and lions protecting the sheep of my father. You see, I didn't matriculate into bear fighting or into sheep, I mean, or into lion fighting, but I have some field experience. And he says that they laid out all of these weapons for him that were the king's. And, he, and the king put his arm on him. He said, I don't want this stuff you're giving me. I have to get, go into battle with what I'm comfortable with. That's your lesson right there. Somebody missed that message. Not all of us are called to go into battle with the same weapons. Just because you see that person comfortable with a sword doesn't mean you have to go to battle with a sword. What is the gift that God gave you to fight? What is the stone that God gave you to cast at the giant? We all have different gifts. And if we all had the same gift, it, it, all our gifts would be nullified. But what God did was he sprinkled them out so that we could all be as a unit together. And it is important that we fight this fight with all the gifts that we have. So as artists. It is important to fight this fight by changing the culture. Everybody say change culture. Change culture. During the Renaissance, I can't remember the name of this field producer. Somebody's going to uh, know it here because we have all these field producers. There was a movie that came out that called, was called The Birth of a Nation. Mm -hmm. And it glorified the KKK. Mm -hmm. And it set the tone of a culture in this, in, in, in this country that if you were bigoted, you were the, the, the son of the righteous. But in, in Harlem, there was a young director, before there was Spike Lee, who was creating theater to the point where it was so good that they were outriding the white writers that they couldn't go out and work for. And that he was creating a narrative, I'm going to get it for you in a second, that was able to combat the birth of a nation. We have to use what we have to continue to fight this narrative. Now, where does that go to today? Let's talk about today, right? We talked about the Renaissance. We talked about Moses and the Bible. What about today? Well, it, today, today, not, if you turn on a TV recently, all you heard was Claudine Gay and plagiarism. The media serves as a, the, as a virus and, and, and they are spewing out information to the public that Claudine Gay got to her position because she plagiarized. Not because she was the most intelligent and sophisticated and jumped all of the ladders that she needed to. They didn't talk about all of the other white presidents of all the other universities that got to where they got by message that she didn't have to go to. So who was there telling our story? No matter what channel you flipped on, you saw this woman being crucified. And then they said, oh, she's a DEI hire. This is how it started. And then when they started going after DEI rights, the silence was deafening. We didn't hear anyone really speak about the truth of the matter. First of all, she's not a DEI hire. And I understood why they were scared of Claudine Gay. Because there was a young black man named Barack Obama that came from Harvard University, became the first black president of the United States, and he was only president of his class of law school. So what are you going to do with a woman who was president of the whole university? So what we need to do as artists in this time is to tell the story as it is to not allow the lie to perpetuate, and we need to do it not only through the pulpit, because as, as the sister talked about uh, TikTok, right? I don't know how many of you here are on TikTok. We have some young folks, so some of y'all on TikTok. We got, yeah, but, but we, if, if you go to church, I don't know. I'm, I'm not talking about your church, but a lot of churches are missing the TikTok generation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very true. So how are you reaching the young generation? 
Now some of us on Instagram, if I'm looking at my millennial brothers and sisters, we're on Instagram, we're good, we're on Facebook. But we have to figure out how do we change the message and how do we do it on the platform, on all platforms, so that our message is amplified. So how do you do that? How do you do what? How, what you just asked. How do you how do you change the message to reach the young people to get them to do? So you got, you got so the way and to let's make it two minutes. Sorry. Oh, okay. go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm gonna make it's it okay. a minute. I'm gonna you. make it a minute. I'm just. You have to go to where they are. Mm -hmm. So someone came to me the other day and they said, uh, Reverend McHenry, well, um, well, how do we reach this message to the uh, Gen Zs and to the Millennials? How do you do that? And I said, Well, if they're not in the church, stop going to the church. I said, They're in the concert. They were Beyonce. You have to create the venue to which they come to. So if you know that the young people are into, I don't know these new dances, you have to create something that they like. A lot of the, uh, and I'm gonna finish with this, the big problem in trying to reach folk is we press upon people what we like instead of asking them what they like. So you first have to ask them what they need, what they like to do, and then Tell the message through that vehicle. Excellent. Thank you I very much. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Ron. Just to add on to your point, I think that when you think about art, you think about something that is a global conversation. You can see a painting. You might be in Paris. You might be in Africa. You could be in Brooklyn. You could be in Queens. That relationship to what you're seeing and that message that the artist wanted to convey, there's no language. We don't have to speak the same language. Right. The same thing with age. There's not a different age group that's gonna say, oh wow, I love the Picasso painting, or I love the Mona Lisa. But now the question is, okay, how do we use this global kind of kind of language, as which is art, which is our art form, to actually now communicate? Mm -hmm. We mentioned TikTok, we mentioned Instagram, we mentioned Facebook. Now, what exactly is happening in the, their world right now as young people that's affecting them? What are their interests? Mm -hmm. What is really going to pique their interest? Is it thinking about entrepreneurship. Is it how do I make money? You know, we get to know a lot of drill songs right now and they want to make money. Now, how do we actually use this vehicle of economic advancement to say, if you are a designer, I can teach you how to make a billion dollar company because it's a billion dollar industry fashion mm -hmm. into it by just using your two hands, the gifts that God gave you. As you mentioned, Brother Ron, about the hands, what, what did God bless you with? So if you do have a gift, and your gift is art, and that is your vehicle to actually change, and your vehicle to actually change even your current economic situation. Now it's about, okay, how do we as leaders begin to educate the youth, the youth to be excellent in their field sets, excellent in dance, excellent in film production, excellent in fashion design. Not just saying, oh, you had an idea that's nice, let's press a heat, press a t-shirt, and sell it on 125th. <laughs> no, let me take you to the steps. Let me tell you how to do a business plan. Let me tell you how to do a business proposal, how to pitch to get a grant for your company, mm -hmm. how to be able to have an LLC or an S Corp or a nonprofit to actually say, this is going to help you get out of your situation. So when you're looking up to the drill rappers or the celebrities on the red carpet, but how do you actually get there? And I think that's the gap that we need to fill as leaders mm -hmm. and using our actual influence to say, this is how you can now get out of your situation. And the people who you are looking up to, you need to find out the steps to get there. Because you're not going to get there just by listening. You're not going to get there just by scrolling on TikTok. You're going to get there by making a plan. And that's literally what our company does and when I see us as well on the panel do to really get them to the next level, and that is activism, that's artivism. That's right. Absolutely. She talked about providing resources. Yeah. That's what you do. Yeah, I would just like to add based on what my wonderful panelists, co-panelists have been sharing, this idea that you know art is not only political and culturally shifting, but it's also incredibly influential. When we mm -hmm. think about Abbott Elementary and how many millions of views come to ABC to see that show a week. Quinta Brunson didn't stop there. She then convinced the network to work with her to create an organization to give back to the teachers that she was trying to display. That's right. And that's like the next level. It's not just about, okay, we've created the work. It's really important to do so because then we get to have history. We get to have a nation sitting down watching Roots. But what do we do now when we have streamers and no one's watching the same thing? Come on, so Ashley. we really have to come together and figure out, okay, what is the, what is the narrative, the, the narrative that we're all understanding and comprehending? And our kids, as myself, we're being reached through these shows. We're being yeah. reached through this content. And so meeting them there, oftentimes, meeting them at the movie theaters to go, see Harriet, meeting them when we're watching when they see us, that introduced a whole generation to the exonerated five. That's right. And then that teaches them 
about social justice and about uh, public policy and literacy and things that they can be doing to influence people. So I would just say from a film and television standpoint, that work is just as influential as meeting them on TikTok because sometimes it is those little clips that end up on TikTok, mm -hmm. but when you're watching that content, what do the artists do then in their daily lives to influence people, but also in the, in the work itself, I think it's just as, it's just as paramount. I definitely awesome agree with that. Before, wait, before you guys answer, if there's anybody with a question, you can line up at the mics. Go ahead. I was also gonna say that, so the Crown Act is a very important mission to, when we talk about oppression, when we talk about discrimination, the Crown Act was created to actually create a respectful and open world for natural hair. And it's crazy that in 2024, we still take pause as people of color to decide how we want to show up in rooms that we have to enter. Like, is my hair actually going to affect this interview and or this date and or this application process, right? There's, there's a way in which our hair and just the embodiment of our, our beings, we take pause. And so in terms of the way that I decided to kind of bridge that gap between how, what can I do instead of talking about it? Like, what can I actually do to help end some kind of systemic oppression? I had realized that several of my dance students had hair issues, hair trauma. I even myself have hair issues, hair trauma. And so in 2022, I decided to make a film about it. And in making a film about it, I also got mission adjacent to something that I was one passionate about, but something that I saw was changing the industry in terms of beauty and wellness. The hair industry, I ain't never seen so many hair products in Rite Aid in my life, okay? Back in the day, we only had Dax. Are you with me? We had African Pride. That's what I knew. And we had Pink Lotion, okay? I remember when Carol's daughter came out, baby! We were excited because finally you had some kind of difference because you knew on your 4C hair, Dax was gonna make it greasy. Pink Lotion, you're not supposed to be using for that 4C, you understand? So with that, I'm seeing that there are so many more hair companies coming out. There are so many more commercials about hair. There are so many more conversations about hair. And I know that in my own community, we were experiencing hair trauma. We were experiencing all kinds of conversations around hair in dance and around how hair was, we were feeling discriminated against. So I named the film Crown. It's a short film. Hopefully somebody in here is gonna get us a feature show. Mm -hmm. I named the film Crown, and the, sh the, the short film tells the story of this young black girl getting ready for the biggest dance audition of her life, and her and her mom trying to figure out how to get her hair in a bun for the first time. Mm. And it has so far won several awards. It has also been in several film festivals and counting, because we're still submitting. <laughs> but in terms of, thank you, in terms of what I can do with my art to raise awareness, to impact change, to provoke thought and conversation. For me, it's about pivoting. Yes, I am a dancer, but that's not all I am. Mm -hmm. At the root, I'm a storyteller. At the root, in my body, I embody story. I embody history. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I can use my art no matter which way I go, if I make a film today, if I make a commercial tomorrow, if I teach a plie tomorrow, if I teach you how to do an African dance from Mali, West Africa, I can use my art to Im 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 really inspire the next generation to know that they are seen, to feel heard, to, f to know that they are not alone in this journey we call life. So for me, I have done what I can in the dance field I have stayed adjacent to how I see the industry trends moving. Like if I see that the beauty industry is taking over, if I see another company in CVS get placed, if I see Miss Tabitha Brown turn into an overnight sensation, but not so overnight because she's been at this for decades, then I'm going to figure out how I can align my storytelling, my vision, my art with those messages. And then somehow it will get that, that viral, that virality. Somehow it will get those eyes on it. Somehow, even with, like in one of the um, scenes in the short film, the mom literally just takes the hot comb off the stove and puts it in a paper towel. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And we zoomed in literally on her going to press the girl's hair and the girl going like this. Why y'all? Cause she burned her ear, okay? 
Like those kinds of things are something that we all can relate to and similar to what you were saying. We don't even have to speak the same language. We from Harlem, I'm from Brooklyn. We don't even have to live in the same house to know, oh, she gonna get her air burned with that, right? So what can we do to align ourselves like, and actually do the work? We get, we get adjacent to the, the commonalities of folk. We get, we get really clear on what is a story that we all know and live every day, and what industry can we align ourselves with to help that story get promoted. You, you, you are absolutely right, right about that. And I, I, that. I think it's profoundly interesting that you brought up the Crown Act, because it does have such a big influence, even when you think about hair and makeup in Hollywood. And like I've been an actress, and Tabitha, actually, funny enough, had to do my hair for me on a shoot, because the person who was assigned to do my hair was not of color and did not know how to do it. And so the Crown Act, in public policy, also changed the way that we showed up in Hollywood, in right. terms of the way that our hair and our makeup looked in terms of presentations. But that also brings me to the point, in terms of when we think about artivism, we also are not thinking about the creative executives right. and the development executives that are oh, signing off rejection. on our shows and figuring out mm -hmm. what is actually going to air. And sometimes their work is just as creative as ours. And so one, we also want to make sure that we have people in positions in Disney, at, uh, at FX, at Hulu, right. within, these, within these structures that are for our stories. Right. Because if you don't, then you're getting stereotypes right. and tropes and all types of things that right. come up and, th and those people are not actively fighting for us as well. So I think just as much as you said, we want to con uh, contribute to the narrative that youth, as much as you want to be in entertainment, there may be a, a 50 other ways for you to come That's into right. it. It doesn't just have to be in front of the camera because we all have a part to play. Y'all right. are dropping gems on this panel. Right. We have, the clock says we have four minutes left. So we want to get as many questions as we can in that. Sorry what about can that. we do as the government is talking about banning TikTok? So, so say it again, the question. What do you do when the, what, 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 what do you do if the government is speaking on banning TikTok? That's yes, the question. Yes. Anybody want to take that? I just think culturally, we have power in numbers. Like we, we come together in church. We come together in Girl Scouts. We come together to braid hair together. We come, what, whatever it is, there's always going to be a baby shower. A like it really isn't coming upon us to be doing it in our homes. Mm -hmm. Like to be getting the messages out. Us relying solely on outside forces when we actually have all the, we are the sauce, y'all. Right. We are the alpha and the omega, like we are the sauce. Right. So us having the answers, we don't necessarily need anybody to give us permission anymore, mm -hmm. right? We never did. We actually have all the permission inside of ourselves. Right. So now it's incumbent upon us to, at the baby shower, be starting to have those conversations. Literally, hey, you see a young, a young person at the baby shower. What do you want to get into? Oh, I really like to do media. You know what? Let me help you apply to these um, salary positions at Disney so that you can then provide access. Like, really affecting that pipeline, I think, is the answer. Yes, and, and to the point of TikTok as well, I think there's, it's, it's two-pronged. One, our culture created what TikTok is today in terms of like TikTok existed, but it wasn't until we got on there that TikTok became what it was. And so one, we can do that again with another app that may perhaps might be a black owned app. Exactly. But secondly, all of these things in terms of government come down to voting and social justice is a huge part of that in our artivism. And like, if you're not voting for the, for your own people and, and interests that are coming to look out for you, then where, where does your income and your currency come from if TikTok goes away? You wanna have representatives that are looking out for you if that, if that were to happen. Anybody else? Oh, I, I was just going to say and just piggyback, uh, we create culture. Right. We create American culture. I mean, every time I'm scrolling through Instagram, I'm not, I'm not on TikTok that heavy, uh, I'm seeing Koreans do hip-hop dances. I'm seeing Chinese people do hip-hop dances. Right. Yeah. So we are what's cool. If they decide to ban TikTok in the United States of America, uh, they will be hurting um, TikTok, will be hurting because of us, because we set the tone. So I just want to say this. When it comes to technology, we've created it. We created it back then, and we've created it now. What I'm talking about, we created the computer. We've created Wi-Fi. We've created all the major tech companies use. We can create our own social media. All right. And, and it's already been created, so we just got to get on it. You want to you wanna answer? This is Marilyn Crawford. She's a panelist on the next panel, entertainment executive. Get the mic. Come on difference between an app and a cloud, okay? We don't own anything on the apps. Right. Right. Those things belong to Meta and TikTok and WeChat and China and et cetera. The only black-owned cloud in the world is the Bizio. 
the B-I-Z-I-O, owned by a black man who worked 12 years at the back room of BlackRock, which is the number one mm -hmm. financial institution in the world. So I, I'm sorry, I'm sitting over there. I had to kind of educate you. Thank the group. you. Thank the, you. The, the, the difference is, the difference is, we have a very difficult time getting financial backing. Mm -hmm. Do we have the brilliance? Absolutely. Yes. yes. Okay. This guy has the brilliance. He, the only financial backing he's gotten from the our our influencers and our celebrities and et cetera was from Tiffany Haddish. Mm -hmm. He got two, uh, two point five million dollars from her. Mm -hmm. Raised another two million with my help with family and friends. But he needs like fifty million dollars so he can be the next TikTok for our community. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry. I What's had the name to, of the I app again? What's the name of his business aid again? It's the Bizio.com. Bizio. Bizio. It was launched on Juneteenth. Wow. And Gail King came to the launch at wow. Virgin Hotels. Mm -hmm. And he is building um, portals. He okay. now runs the back room of Ghana's uh, stock mm -hmm. and trade. Mm -hmm. He has portals for health. He has portals for education, portals for fashion, mm -hmm. portals for uh, influencers, portals for uh, investments, etc. I don't think it'll really get to come out until January of, tw this is 24. I'm sorry, I'm old, y'all. <laughs> uh, I don't think it'll get to come out until the end of 2024, but it's not that it's not created, it's just that he needs financing. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank and, you, Marilyn Crocker. Make sure y'all stay for the next panel. She's on there, she's dropping gems. And influencers can, can, can talk about this right. and help get that support. It, it takes all of us coming yeah. together. So yeah. thank you for letting us and know so that is, we can do our work. This yeah. is all connected to the DEI fight as well. But absolutely. go ahead. Yeah, absolutely, guys. This, this panel is just amazing. My name is Gwen Black, and I'm founder of Arts and Jazz Fest New York City. 21 years, but 36 years of advocating for arts and jazz. And really what is missing in the arts is all of us have to look at ourselves as small businesses or even just as a business. So my challenge and my question to the panel is, going forward, how are we going to work together to get the government to give us money? Because they, we are taxpayers. We pay our taxes and that money you're giving out into the community and when we submit our proposal and you tell me no, because I wanna do something to curb gun violence, that's unacceptable. We gotta discuss it more, we gotta fight for it more. We are small businesses and we have to be treated like every other business industry that the government should support. So if anyone wants to add to that, please do and talk about how you are positioning yourself as a business. Because our young people have to know the arts is a business. Right. Thank you. I wanna share that there's power in multiplicity. Um, and we, the same way this room is filled up, when there are town hall meetings for your actual assemblies, we also have to fill those rooms too. Mm -hmm. Recently, I started going to uh, community board nine and 10 meetings. I started to go into uh, different art meetings and seeing, okay, who else is in the room? Because those are the rooms where decisions are being made. Those are the rooms where, listen, bring all your kids. We bring our family to church, we bring our family here and there. Easter Sunday just passed and we know the church was filled the same way it was filled for that. We also need to be there for those actual meetings when things are happening, when petitions are being signed, when they're asking, hey, we're gonna vote to pass this law. Everybody in favor say aye. We need to be there at just as well. I, you know, people go to fashion shows and all types of events and I love when they pull up to our fashion shows, but we wanna see that same report happen on local assemblies where people are actually gathering. Also, flipping it back to art, mm -hmm. art being our medium using art to actually say how many people can purchase a t-shirt that says stop gun violence you know and there's different ways that we've seen that movement kind of be perpetuated during uh you know COVID 19 where we've seen people protesting in the streets but it doesn't just stop there it didn't just stop it didn't just go away the brutality different things that were happening in our society in our world didn't stop so how do we continue this conversation i think as a people sometimes the news dies down we get complacent again we get comfortable again and no as artists, how do we keep going? So even if you go through in Harlem, you'll see these beautiful murals along the uh, East Harlem, and some of our designers participate in this mural, like Christina Lane, mm -hmm. um, participate in that mural where we actually use our art to actually paint it on the street and say, okay, how do we kind of, again, answer this so that way it's something that people don't forget about. It doesn't just end up as a, oh, okay, that was old news. It's permanent. And how do we use that as a way to kind of cement what's happening or what our message really is? Right, and vote for representatives that have your best interest That's at right. heart. That's if you right. do not, then you can't complain later when they're yeah. not That's supporting right. you. Okay. And, and in addition to that, also when you do have 
a substantial you know, career or you're building, seek legal advice. These are things, that there's, pl there's places where you can get free legal advice, but of course, like if you don't understand the business and you're not understanding how to read your own contracts, you don't have to do it alone. There are mentors and people that will support you That's in that right. endeavor, but oftentimes when we don't read our contracts, we look up 20 years from now and we're out of the conversation mm -hmm. and out of our own resources. So I would say, you know, start, start with the law. I definitely agree with that. I believe um, also connecting with more leaders from the community. Mm -hmm. You know, you got I, I went on tour, a school tour for elementary, junior high school, and, and high school. And I started to meet more leaders in the community, more activists, and people that was compassionate, kind-hearted, and appreciate creativity. Because creativity was, you know, primarily, it's the foundation to change. So when you link up with these kind of people that have the same mindset as you, you can make change and you could get the right funding for your businesses. You know, arts funding has been in this city one of the first things to get cut. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to being an artist, being an entrepreneur, it affects my entire industry, our entire industry, right? Like how are we going to work, literally. Le like literally, right? And so what I, have quite often done is really invested in the seeds of our community, which is our children. Our children, when they have someone that looks like them, that they can see in front of them having a business. I mean, I bring, like we had a flood the other day in my studio. I called on the students to help because you need to see a black woman in front of you pivot in the face of adversity. It can't always be that everything is glitz and glam. I need to show you the grunge because the, the reality of business is that it's hard work. Hello? Right. <laughs> right. So you want to talk about small business, large impact? It's hard work to sustain. For my business, we've been in existence for 11 years and counting. And for 11 years, it became clear to me that I didn't need to hide how hard it was. Mm -hmm. I didn't need to put on this like, Pre pretense and this posture of everything is all great being in an arts industry and having a business, right? And so for me, I've really been committed to how can I get the children more involved in the day-to-day? -day? A lot of times students want to go and get a degree in business. The best degree in business is shadowing a business owner. The best degree in business is having a business. So bringing them in, creating these community internships, I am always like thinking about training workshops, like how can I have more children, more teenagers shadow us earlier on? I started teaching at nine years old because my dance teacher saw, oh, she can dance and she knows how to communicate dance. So I bring in nine-year-olds. You come in, you sit in the front, you sit at the lobby, you answer the phones. You start from the phones, you move into the dance studio. Like, we need to empower them with the information because then they actually have ac actual access. Thank you. The last two questions. Um, I wanted to say thank you. I relate to everything you all said. Um, I just want information on how to start a strong foundation in art. I practice various types of art, so, yeah. Train. Yep. Keep training. Sharpen your tools till no one can deny you. And I mean that seriously. When I started, what, what, art, what art are you in? Artist through and through, artist through and through. Love that for you, love that for you. Train, align yourself, like you said you do acrylic painting. Find black artists that you can send an email to. I remember when I was, how old are you? Do you mind? When I so when I was in high school, Sarah Jones, she's this amazing comedian, amazing actress that I used to follow before there was social media. And when I went to her show, she had a show called Bridge and Tunnel. I saw myself on stage. It was the first time that I had really like seen a, a, a multiplicitous woman on stage in that way that I could identify with. She did accents, she wrote the show, she directed the show, she produced the show. It was something that I really identified with. I found her email. I reached out to her and I interned for her for free. I reached out to her because I, I knew that there was something in me that I could see in her and I needed to be around her. I needed to, I needed to have more access to the information to be able to make better decisions about how I wanted to move. So I would say align yourself, find, find those people, not to idolize, but to really learn from and also sharpen your skills till they 
prick somebody when they <laughs> encounter your skills, literally. That's right. And I, I would tell you, showcase. Showcase what you got. Whatever you have right now, put it out to the world. Let them see what you have. And they, if, you know, your art tells one side of the story. Them meeting you is another side. If they find out who you are, they'll love the work that you put out. And uh, everybody that won before, they lost before. That's right. That's right. So don't be afraid to not be appreciated. Just go out there, show them what you have, and you'll grow from there. Okay? Okay. We got to, wait, wait. We got to start the next, and that was excellent. Thank I want to show up really quickly. Document your work. Because we're talking about TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all of these things, document your work. People, like he said, are going to find you. Document your work and do not be afraid to slide in somebody's DM and say, hey, I'd like to be your apprentice. I'd like to learn from you. I want to grow from you. People are answering their DMs. They're not like, you know, other people. We, even us. Mm -hmm. DM all of us. How can I be an intern? I have interns working with me right now. Right. How can I learn? How can I grow? That way you're able to really expand. And sometimes, in some ways, you'll catapult faster than other people will because you're just putting yourself out there. So mm -hmm. don't be afraid to put yourself out there, okay? Absolutely right. Yeah. We're gonna, the next panel is in the room. The panelists are here. If you are here, come to the front, please. I, I know y'all are on the front already. But on this side, please come to the front and be ready to enter. Felivi is the next moderator. This will be our last question. Please make the answers a minute, please. I'm sorry, panelists. <laughs> All right. And then we're going to wrap. Go ahead. All right, I was told to keep this short, so I'm going to make this quick. Hi, my name is Josiah Kayan. I am the treasurer of the Texas Community Raise a Child, started by my mom, Susan Samuel, who was the Queen's found, uh, who was the founder of the Queen's Chapter of National Action Network. Um, how do you reach people in underserved neighborhoods? Because a lot of times there are people who fall through the cracks, not because they don't try, but because they don't think that they can achieve anything greater than what they see. Some people, all they see are certain drill rappers and people on screen thinking that's all they, or like some people, all, like their highest dream is baddies. Like, like it's, it's true. Like, there, like there, are, there are a lot of people who don't think that there's more out there for them. And there are people who are very creative. And this is the second part of my question. I personally am into like very much like animation. I was wondering like to like the people who on the panel who are like into like film and are like involved in film, how far have you delved into animation? Because there's a lot of black representation in animation recently that can be had. Like if mm -hmm. any of you have seen Spider-Verse, like Miles Morales, that's kind of like the biggest at the current moment. And there's so much more out there that can be explored and so much more that can be like brought into film mm -hmm. through animation. I would just answer the animation part and then I'll let... And um, I'll yeah. the, okay. okay, love that for us. <laughs> okay, um, well, just really quickly, I mean, I think a lot of people, I have some friends who are interested in animation and have been working in film and animation, and it starts a lot of times with seeking the education that will get you there, because sometimes it's not so much as like, okay, you're already skilled and you walk into the room, but it's about the mentors and the professors and the teachers that will then say, you know what, let me put you on. Or I, I used to work at this animation studio and now I can get you an internship. So for me, it's always been about building that network through my educational portals, um, because those people are the ones that get placed at the places that are making the decisions about what type of representation we're gonna see in animation. And there has been an influx, but there should be so much more. So I think it's really kind of finding the funnels and a lot of times the funnels are through these arts programs, um, and that's just what I've seen personally. As far as the under-resourced community, so that's where I specialize. I only go to the, sh to the streets, to be honest with you. And I mean that literally. I do free classes in the summer in the street, literally. I take the boom box, I get a sound permit, and we offer free classes because in our communities, we don't know what we don't know. And we don't know what we don't know because we don't know what we can't see. So if we see it, then we could be it, literally. So for me, I just show it. All right, we going, you know, like, and, I, and I, I grew up from that, right? I mentioned at the beginning of this panel that Mama Kathy was our wardrobe and our manager, mm -hmm. and me, Ashley, and Dominique were in the In Voguettes. It was the first time I had gone to Cotton Club. Right. It was the first time that we knew of the Apollo because we had the actual visual representation. Right. We had someone who was going out there and doing it. So maybe for you, I implore you, you see that there are people in your community who are falling through the cracks, it is now your cultural responsibility to go and show them what the other side looks like because you have the power. You don't need permission from anybody. You actually can go and get three and four of them that are standing on the corner and ask them if they're into animation and then all of a sudden you got an animation crew. Yeah. That's right. 
That's right. right. That's right. I'm going to give well, you all my cards. Wait, wait, wait. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you to our panelists, Ron, Check, Yvonne, Charisma, and Ashley. Artivism is a movement. Join us. Let's take a photo of the Thank you, Ashley. Let's give them a hand one more time, everybody. We're going to take a picture. D is right there. Y'all stay right here. Are they going up or down? Okay, come on, Ashley. Test. All right, we're going to ask that you guys will begin to take your seats, and I'm also going to ask that y'all will start making room for other folks that are getting ready to come into this room, because our criminal justice panel is ending now, and so we are moving into our entrepreneurship panel, and also something else special, so if we are having conversations to my right, your left, I'm going to ask that you guys will exit the room. Um, if the person next to you is talking, tell them to be quiet. Shh. We're going to ask that if you want to have conversations, that you take it into the hallway while we are beginning our next panel. Thank you all again. Give yourselves a round of applause for sticking it out with us. That was a good panel on artivism. Now we are going to have our panel into entrepreneurship and I want to give them all the time possible. But before they come up for Levy, who is going to be moderating, he's going to introduce and do all of that. But I wanted to make sure that they were introduced with their panel. All right? All right. Come on, for Levy. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. How we doing? How we doing? Give me a round of applause. Give me a round of applause. One more thing. I know we just did, I know we just did one panel. I asked if you guys can. Please go outside just so that I could give time real quick. But before I start my panel, I do want to give an award out. Um, we were supposed to do it earlier, but it's fine. We're doing it now. Uh, it's about our award is to the 100 black men of New York City. Um, we can give them a round of applause. Um, 100 black men did send a bio in. Um, and I looked at it, and I said, no, I'm not going to read the bio. I'm going to give a personal story. And the reason why is because I'm a junior member of 100 black men, and without them, I don't even think I would be part of NAN. And so I'm gonna start with a small, quick story. The first time I've ever even stepped into the Sheraton was because 100 black men had a gala. And like I said, I was a junior member. Um, I just got accepted to Morehouse College. I walked into their office. I introduced my, myself. They said, listen, we got you. We're gonna help you out any way we can. And so they told me they had a gala. I didn't even have a suit. They gave me a full suit, you know? And I went to the gala and that was the first time I see so many black men that just look like me that were lawyers, attorneys, and just doing amazing stuff in the community, giving out scholarship, giving me mentorship. And I remember there was Chuck Schumer, and I saw him, and I was like, I want to get a picture with him. And William Allen, who's also a member of Hunch Black Men and was the former crisis director for National Action Network, saw me trying to get a picture and literally grabbed me and grabbed Chuck Schumer and said, listen, this man wants to get a picture. And because of that, that started my connection working with National Action Network and so much other. And I have countless stories of how 100 black men has helped me. Most of the reason why I'm even able to pay for more house is because of them. I know how to play golf because of them. They had a golf competition. They said they're going to teach us how to play golf. And then at the end of the, um, at the, end of the teachers, we're going to have a competition. I went to every single 
practice. And then when it came to that, to that competition, I was Tiger Woods. And I got that $5,000 scholarship. So I want to thank you guys so much for that. And they also gifted me golf clubs. So I am eternally, eternally grateful for 100 Black Men. And I hope one day I will become a member of 100 Black Men. So I appreciate you two gentlemen. If you mind, come up so I can present you this award. Thank you so much. I was told immediately, don't be too long. So my name is Eric Clyde. I'm the executive director of 100 Black Men in New York. Um, Felivi is an amazing young man. We are so happy to have him part of our programming, um, and we're very happy to accept this award. 100 Black Men was started in 1963. The areas that we focus in are education and mentoring, health and wellness, and economic empowerment. And so our mission really is to work in the communities where our people are. And we're very, very excited to be here and always be part of the movement. And we are there on Thursdays, uh, you know, fighting for DEI. So that'll be my 30-second communication. Brother? <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Will Dennis. I'm the co-chair of one of the 100 Black Men's signature programs, program that Felivi was in called the Junior 100 Program. It's a 17-week program held every Saturday that we've been doing for the past 12 years, essentially teaching these young men what high schools don't. Edu uh, Resume writing, how to create a business plan. We do uh, 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 dining etiquette courses. Today we, we taught the scholars about credit and how to make credit work for you. The goal of the program is to, it's to bridge the gap into careers of entrepreneurship, but also into, into their college readiness, right? There's a gap in education, but it's also because there's a gap in providing them with the resources, and there's a gap in providing them with that access. Our goal is to give them no access so they could be just as strong as those other counterparts as they go to college and beyond. So thank you, National Action Network, for this. Thank you for leaving. All right, thank you guys again. Now we can start on my panel, so I'm gonna ask all my panelists if you want, if you can, please come up to the stage. Please come up to the stage. Yeah, I'll start. 
There's no space on that. Now, you got this. <laughs> now, um, before I let my panelists introduce themselves, I'm going to tell the reason why I wanted this panel. So everybody, of course, I go to Morehouse. I'm, I'm studying business, concentration, marketing with a minor entrepreneurship. And for me, one thing I've been wanting to make sure is when I start creating businesses and start working in the business field, I still figure a way to still have the movement in it. Uh, whether it's donation or whether it's standing up. And so that's the main reason I wanted to create this panel. And also just to teach other young people about entrepreneurship and how they could still make money, do businesses, but still help the movement out. So I'm going to start you, sir, and then we're going to move on from there. So again, my name is uh, Eric Clayette. And my Get close to the mic. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. So my name is Eric Clayette, and my W-2 work is the executive director for 100 Black Men. But my 1099 has been development. I own a cleaning company, I own a limousine company. Uh, I've been a serial on entrepreneur. My first business was actually uh, a paraphernalia company that I started right out of college because I knew day one I never really wanted a job. I wanted to be able to work. I didn't, didn't want a job. So I'll stop and pass the mic. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. All right, cool, cool. My name is Derek Lewis. I serve as the field manager for the NAACP Youth and College Division. Uh, I guess you said on the W-2 side, all right? Um, but also for myself, um, I am a founder of a nonprofit, co-founder of a nonprofit called Thrives. Um, so we can talk a little bit more about that throughout the panel, but I'll pass it on to the next panelist. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Harold Hassan Flake and I am the Vice President of the Greater Allen Development Corporation out in Queens. Um, <laughs> and, and so since we're talking about our W-2s, my, that is my, we at Greater Allen Development, we are in a position to where we are taking entrepreneurship very seriously and as a community organization, we want to make sure that we are providing our entrepreneurs with the resources, with the information, and with the opportunities that they need to succeed. And so we understand that, it, it, that entrepreneurship feeds into a larger conversation, which is closing the wealth gap, which we all know is important to us, and the other conversation that we um, intend on addressing it, it, that we intend on continuing to address is um, generational wealth. And we can see how entrepreneurship is one way that we can make sure that we are leaving um, things behind for our children. So I look forward to talking you to you today and thank you for having me. Peace, my name is Prophet. I'm the co-founder, president and CEO of the Black Music Action Coalition an organization that was formed in 2020 to hold our industry accountable to dismantle systemic racism within the music industry, but also using that collective bargaining power and influence to impact legislation, policy. And one of the issues that we are addressing heavily this year is economic justice, uh, which is at the cornerstone of all the issues that we have dealt with in this country since we got here. So um, this panel is extremely important, and thank you guys for having me. Hello everyone, my name is Larell Weisinger. I am a 16 year old entrepreneur running and operating my own food T truck. Tell them that again, how old are you? I'm a 16 year old entrepreneur. Can we give him a round of applause, y'all? <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> I run and operate my food truck, Chili Barkers, in Las Vegas, Nevada, alongside my mother, Tatiana, in the front row, and my hey. stepdad, Shots by Jay. Give him a round of applause. I'm based in all things chili. What I'm most known for is my cornbread bun cake that I load with my homemade chili, cheese, sour cream, and green onions. And I, I'm, <laughs> that sounds good, right? Yeah. I'm hungry right now. Making us hungry. 
And I'm also in the culinary program, so I've expanded my chili expertise to different things. I do bacon top chili dogs, chili chips, chili baked potatoes, and I have my specialty drinks, my blue lemonade, and my extreme Kool-Aid. Um, I'm also a youth leader of the Las Vegas chapter of NAN, who just, <laughs> thank you. And we just like to highlight um, the youth in the community and all the talent that's been hidden within the youth department. And we try to go out and do different community events to make sure that is highlighted within the youth to show that we are here and we are here to show our talent. So thank you all for, Nan, for having me today. I can't wait to talk. I love it. Hi, I'm L. Marilyn Crawford. Why y'all get to sit, sit the senior citizen next to the 16 year old? <laughs> let me just tell you, this is the most important panel That's of right. the week. That's right. And let me tell you why. Because this is intergenerational. This is preparing the future. That's right. It might not be the most attended, but it should be because we should have everyone here that's an influence in our young people's lives. And I've given my life to dedicating that. I've mentored over 107 young people to the point where Harvard brought an entire class down to spend two days with me. I think that our people, our people, our culture, are some of the most, they're the smartest, the most elegant, they're the most compassionate, and they're most innovative in the world. They don't want us to know that. I'm sorry. Let me, let me, I, just, I was supposed to introduce myself. I'm sorry. Okay. So I'm CEO of uh, Windsor Primetime and also a partner in Malca Equities. Uh, I was uh, bred and buttered in Lancaster, South Carolina, uh, marinated in Harlem, and cooked throughout the world. I have dual citizenship with Dubai and America. Nice to meet you. I love that you was marinated in Harlem. <laughs> oh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christina Lane. I just want to thank you, Ashley, for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, it's just been an emotional day. My birthday is tomorrow, my little cousin. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I just have a lot on my mind, but I'm very thankful to be here, and I thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Christina Lane, as I said, and my brand is Christina's Lane. I uh, created this jacket, so I do wearable art. Um, I'm a multimedia journalist, visual artist. Sometimes it's hard for me to like <laughs> explain what I do because I do so much. But I, like I said, I'm from Harlem. Um, I do a lot of things within my Harlem community. I started with National Action Network what, 2008? 2008, I was modeling with um, Ashley Sharpton and um, Dominique. So, yeah, so I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> all right, all right. All right, let's start with the questions. Um, I wanna start with you, young man. Uh, 16 years old, what made you say, I wanna start a food truck business? You know, not most 16 year olds was, even me 16 year old, I wasn't even thinking about Nan. So please tell me why, 16 years old, you was thinking of that. At 16, that kind of developed over time. When I was younger, I really didn't even know what the word entrepreneur was, let alone how to spell it. <laughs> but I had, like I said, my mom, she was one of my biggest motivators, my inspiration, my partner, my hand, right hand, well, woman, not man, but right hand woman. And she kind of guided me <laughs> through everything, a part of being an entrepreneur, because when I was younger, I honestly thought, you know, I grew up to be, you know, six foot, you know, being the NBA, playing football or something. I stand here at 5'8". I'm like, no, that's not happening. But, <laughs> but no, she was definitely my biggest backbone in helping me be an entrepreneur and keeping the entrepreneur mindset. But one thing she did make me say to myself, is this something you want to actually do? You know, being an entrepreneur, a lot of people just see the money, the fame, the I'm independent. But being independent is a lot harder than people think it is. Yes. You know, you're on your own. Sometimes you got to be your own motivator. You got to wake up each day. If I'm not making any sales, do I still want to do this? But she was definitely the biggest encouragement telling me, like, if this is something you really want to do, you're going to see the growth in the end. No matter what it looks like right now, whether you have 30 sales this day or three sales the next, are you still going to push? And that's one thing she really encouraged me to do. So that is my biggest motive right there. My mom and God, thank you for blessing me with her. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mom. My next question is for you, Prophet. Um, there's a lot of young men, young people in general that are very interested in being rappers, with being singers and really getting into the music industry. Um, but what would you, if you give them one advice, you know, of how to get in, but also being true to your roots and remembering your people and how to give back, 
what would you say? So the question is, if you want to get into the industry, what would I say then how, what yeah. the responsibility is once you get in with that? Exactly, okay. what's the responsibilities, yes. Well, first and foremost, um, for those who want to be rappers and singers, that's great, right? But this is the music business. Mm -hmm. There's so many entry points to this business, and there's so many people that make money off of our culture that don't sing and don't dance and don't do any of that. So what we first have to understand is the various entry points to this thing. Whether you are an accountant, whether you are a carpenter, whether you are a, 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 a cook, whether you are a barber, there are all kind of lanes for you within this entertainment industry. First thing is learning. The entertainment business is the one business we get into that we feel we don't have to learn. If we want to be a doctor, we go to medical school. If you want to be a lawyer, you go to law school. If you want to get in the entertainment industry, just say, I'm in it, right? And what happens is so much generational wealth have been robbed from black America through bad contracts and, and, and the robbing of our talent that your responsibility today, if, if you're a singer, if you're a dancer, any aspect of this industry that you want to be in is to learn it. Learn it so that we can protect the IP. Thank you, thank you. Now this is a question for anybody on the board. Um, we have various organizations here. I want to ask about resources. You know, whether it's for a young person to get mentorship, whether it's for them to get grants to start their business, whatever it is, what resources do you guys have? I know someone was talking about an app earlier, but let's, let's get into it. What, what type of resources do you guys have to give to young people if they're trying to start a business and get into entrepreneurship? I can go um, real quick. Derek Lewis, uh, NAACP field manager. Um, so when you think about resources, let me take us back real quick. Uh, from an NAACP standpoint, we noticed from March, I mean from February to April in 2020 that black businesses declined by 40%. Declining meaning that they weren't able to stay afloat, they weren't able to pay their employees, or they eventually had to shut down due to COVID-19. So for us, what we have to realize is that when you talk about black entrepreneurship or black wealth, it's not at stake, all right? And most importantly, since COVID-19 has affected that, how are we now as an organization, as we talk about advocating for black people, realistically, in order for us to live in this world, live in a world where we can live comfortably, we need economics, we need money. So we collaborated with a number of different organizations, a lot of people know Damon Johnson, um, for the Power Shift Grant. The Power Shift Grant is where, for Black Entrepreneur Day, the NAACP, along with other organizations, come together with about a pool or about a pot of $500,000 to $750,000 to where we are able to distribute $25,000 grants to those black businesses. Now, this is a small window to apply, but this happens every year, and every year we've been able to grant at least 10 to 20, um, 10 to 20 businesses at least at $25,000. So that's just on the surface level, and that's open to anybody here in New York or anywhere, anybody can apply to that. We've also been able to partner with Hello Alice and Kickoff to really identify how can we make a more of a impact where we're actually connecting with small black businesses. Small black businesses that may not get looked at, that may not get the funding that I just talked about as far as $25,000, but at least five to $10,000 because now what we understand is that in order for us to support black businesses and to support black generational wealth is that black businesses need resources as well. Right. They need resources so that they can buy their product. They need resources so they can also flip the product and bring some more money back in, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. But on top of that, when it comes from an educational standpoint, when it comes to training, when it comes to with you running your small business, do you, do you really understand what is necessary for you to, to sustain your business? Are you aware of the taxes? Are you aware of what you need to do? Are you aware of staff? Are you aware of your capacity, your product, et cetera? So now we're not longer just giving you the funding for it, but also educating you at the same time. I'd, I'd also like to, to share that 100 Black Men, um, one of the principal resources that we have available is actually mentorship. There are lots of men that are associated with the organization that are business owners or entrepreneurs, and that's a wonderful opportunity for young entrepreneurs to see. I think it was said in the last panel, if you see people doing the work you want to do, there's an opportunity to learn how to do that work. So we certainly have that available as a resource. Similarly, we actually have worked with Moed Hennessy um, on a grant that's called Unfinished Business, where we've delivered more than $3 million to small businesses across the United States, echoing some of the things that you know Brother uh, Lewis pointed out. 
The other thing that I would say is when you are an entrepreneur, it is important that you write down your business plan. You have a right. sense of what it is you want to do, how you want to get it done, and you, and you can begin to address the questions. Because when you want to go to Lazard, you want to go to Goldman Sachs, you want to go to Morgan Stanley for bigger pieces of money, you have to be able to answer some very specific questions. And that's part of being an entrepreneur. You have to, you know, people talk about what I always say is that, you know, you win and you learn. You never lose. So you may be turned down six, seven times to get the kind of funding that you think that you want. But each time you should be taking that opportunity to learn what they're asking for. And each time you come back and one day you will have enough information. You have all the stuff that people can't tell you no. You've checked all the boxes, and then you're in front of the right people. And if you keep showing up, that's also impressive. So again, the three things that I would say, one, we have mentorship opportunities for young entrepreneurs at Hunter Black Men. We also have a uh, grant opportunity that uh, is called Unfinished Business. And then I would also say that we are happy to talk to you about how to put together a good business plan. Thank you. I just and, want to add to I, that. Oh, yeah, if, if I may. The, the one thing that we try to do at Greater Allen is make sure that we provide the opportunity for entrepreneurs to come in and basically have that initial conversation, that initial one-on-one -on -one that says, like you said, what is in your business plan and how do you want to accomplish that? Because a lot of people have the talent, they have the, the raw talent to get it done, but what they don't have is the business savvy. And so sitting down one-on-one, -on -one, organizations that sit down one-on-one -on -one with, with uh, prospective entrepreneurs and go through what they need to get those grant funds and what they need um, so to pull in legal and make recommendations for legal people, make recommendations for accountants, based specifically based on what that business is. So one of the things that I would say is that look for these organizations that do that forensic analysis of your business and tell you what you need to do to get where you want to be. Yeah, that, that's my question. Everything is virtual oh, now, me. you know. Knowledge is power. I love the fact that we have specific organizations that we can go to for grants and et cetera, but the work starts with you. You need to start investigating and educating yourself on how to do a business plan, if that's where you started. If you already have a business, you still need to do a business plan, because they want to know how you're going to generate revenue and how you're going to elevate. So there's, I, I teach business communications to certify um, black and minority businesses for the MTA in, D in uh, New York. I teach it twice a year. The, the main thing that I tell people is ACE. Analyze, communicate, and elevate. So I'm, I'm not going to go into how to do the business plan. You can Google that. But try to Google a business plan and get as much information there, understanding what you want your niche to be, what, where you want to go with your niche, and et cetera. I started out, and I'll make this really quick. Um, my father was a janitor down south. My mother was a cook. So I started out with um, an education of the only thing that we could do was a lawyer, doctor, candlestick maker, teacher, et cetera. And like my brother Prophet here said, there's so many opportunities within each industry. You know, I own three global businesses now. I do. Um, I own Malca Equities uh, with two other partners. You know, uh, we just did a launched a hundred million dollar fund, but we have a, a two billion dollar fund that we're launching globally. I did a dual business with in uh, with Dubai, and starting in June, we're going to launch Alpha uh, Global Enterprises for all of the people who want to be in business. It's going to tell you from A to Z what you need to do how you get a business, what you need to write for, to get a business, and across all the um, multiple channels, uh, if you want to invest in a business, if you're looking for an investor in a business, anything for an entrepreneur will be there from A to Z. And I didn't want to do this, but I kept being inundated by people asking me questions. So I said, let's just put it in a platform so people can go and they can investigate themselves. Awesome. I want to talk about networking. Um, there's one thing I've been learning since I don't even know forever is your network is your net worth. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk about certain connections you believe a young entrepreneur should have. You know, key network. Yeah, you can start over there. 
I was going to get into that, but I'm, I'm glad that you started. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like you said, yes, networking is your net worth. And um, the recent panel, you got to use social media. You can't be afraid to reach out to people. And I'm telling you, I, I done reach out to Angie Martinez. No, she never answered. But I had a few other people answer. So, I'm, you know, I was able to shadow a lot of news reporters. This is how I got into my field. So I reached out to Nicole Johnson, who is from PIX11, who is my mentor, my sister. My, I love her. Like, she answers for everything, even through crisis and everything. Um, so I started out with the Bronx Journalism Workshop, and then I started with BronxNet, all because of her. I reached out to uh, Lindsay, uh, I forgot her last name. Lindsay, she's from um, Channel One. Then I also reached out to a few, I, I reached out to a few news reporters because this is what I know I like to do. I like to be in, <laughs> first and foremost, when I watch the news, I watch the news every day. I mm -hmm. look for their social media handles. So if I like the way you told the story or I love the way you look, I'm like, mm, I want to check out, I'm going to check out her social media and, and f you know, reach out to them. So that's networking. You got to go to these places. You got to. You got to go. <laughs> you got to do the work. You know, Build, yes. I'm sorry, sis, I didn't mean. No, no, no problem. No, please finish that thought. Yes, no, so I mean you have to do the work. You have to be in these places. You have to speak to people. You gotta get your business cards and stuff like that. So like I said, you know, I reached out to a lot of people on social media and that's how I got into a lot of doors. You know, I, I would say to her point, yeah, give her a round of applause for that. Well, give her a round of applause for her tenacity, right? Her willingness to do it. But to that point, you know, this whole thing about networking, a couple things. One, bring something to the table besides an appetite. See, this idea that your net worth is connected to your network is true, but it's also connected to what, in, in fact, you are bringing to the table. Because people who are doing stuff want to be around other people who are doing stuff, right? Mm. So you need to first figure out what it is you're trying to do. Seven habits of highly effective people, one of them speak to think with the end in mind first. Have a plan so you can work backwards to get there. Then you know the type of people you need to attract to you. You need to know the type of networks you need to be in. And then when you're in that and you're shining like that, people will recognize it, right? People will recognize it. But one thing I will say about this generation, I love your generation, one of the most powerful generations to ever come into the hours of time. You have more information available to you than we've ever had before. But there's also this false narrative of what success looks like sometimes. And I think because, you know, if you're not a millionaire by 18 off of TikTok or YouTube or 21, you failed, right? Or there's some steps we can skip in understanding traditional business. Because internet, say, we could blow up. We're just doing one move, and then now we're making $25,000 a month, and we don't need to go through the traditional steps of understanding business, right? So understand where you want to go. Bring more to the table besides an appetite. And make sure that you're clear about your path because the clearer you are, the clearer will be the people that you surround yourself with or that come into your path. And, and don't be afraid of a no. It's OK. You might get 10 no's and you might get one yes. Don't be afraid of a no. And don't be afraid to walk up and introduce yourself to anyone. You know? I have made millions off cold calls, walking up to CEOs, literally. And, and I'm, I'm not even going to tell you the name of them because you'll know him. But there was a CEO having lunch at Cipriani's. Never met the man before in my life. Uh, he happened to be Caucasian. I walked up to him and I said, sir, I don't want to disturb your lunch. But my name is Marilyn Crawford. And basically, I can bring value to your organization. And I, I said, I, I, I know that your holding company is ABC, because I've done my homework. Mm, I've done my on. homework. And I said, I, I, like I said, I don't want to disturb your lunch. Is there someone in your office I can call and do my presentation to? And he wrote down a name and number and gave it to me, and I went back to my table. Wow. 
But if he had said no, it's okay. Because I tried. Don't be afraid of no. And the first black billionaire, Reginald F. Lewis, how many of you know who that is? Raise your hand. It, it's, it's not Jay-Z. It's, it's not, it was Reginald F. Lewis. He did the first billion-dollar deal on Wall Street. He did a $1.4 billion overseas leverage buyout. He's the only person in the history of Harvard that never applied to Harvard, that they came after him. He's the only one that had the first international building on that campus named after him. And then he went to HBCUs and donated $1.5 million to Howard, $1.6 million somewhere else, Virginia Union, et cetera. You need to read his book, Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun? That's right. That's okay? The the, so I'm saying what he always says was keep going no matter what. So if you get 10 no's, you keep going. I'm sorry, I don't want to keep going. Keep going. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to also share a couple of things. You, you've probably heard this adage before. It's who you know, who knows you, and what you know. It's who you know, importantly, who knows you, and then what you know. So the introduction component that Ms. Crawford just pointed out is significantly important. Once they know you, that's important. The next step to that is to understand that people do business with people that they like. People do business with people that they like. All things being equal, people are going to turn to the people that they know, that they like, that they think they can interact with. I, can, I, I understand the way this person communicates. I like the way they present themselves. So the networking, there are lots of pieces, a lot of intricacies that are tied to the networking, but people are going to do business with you because they like the way you present yourself. You're not out of shape. You're not out of, you know, out of line in terms of what you say. And they're like, oh, that's somebody I identify with. And also to Ms. Crawford's point, don't be afraid of the no. There is no no. There's a win, and then there's a learn. Thank you. What, one, oh, oh, one other thing, and to her point, stay in contact. Read your papers daily. I used to pick three papers and used to read them back, back and forth. And when an opportunity comes, you might create it yourself. You know, I created my own opportunity for Saudi Arabia. Come on. They, they're like, who is this little black girl coming up in here? Okay. <laughs> So you, and I created an opportunity call because I read a paper, saw a niche, Googled who was in charge over there, a, a guy named Turkey over Ambassadors, and literally tracked him down, and it took me 17 people, but I got to him. So don't be afraid. No, you're good. Oh, um, uh, yeah, networking is very vital. You want to make sure you get yourself out there, especially in this generation. We think we're limited to just our screens, but making your presence known is also a big step in business. You could have the best product out there, but no one knows who you are. And yeah, you can send a text message, send an email, but sometimes those go to spam and no one knows. So making sure you actually go to these places, meet these people. I've met a lot of great mentors and people along the way just by making myself known, going out and speaking and talking just like this to them and telling them my story and just making a whole bunch of great connections. So don't just be limited to your phones, your screens. Making your presence known is a big step, especially being an entrepreneur. Because a lot of people may not know you. They can walk past you on the street and be like, I don't know that guy. But you want to make sure when you walk past someone, they're like, hey, that's Chili Barkers, or hey, that's somebody else, you know? So make your presence known in these spaces and places like these by getting yourself out there, past your screen, especially in this generation, everyone's so tech savvy, but you can do a whole lot more with your voice and your presence. Listen, listen, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Y'all don't don't skip past what he just said. That was look when, when there's jewels that's dropped. Y'all y'all take yeah. a second for that. Right. He said beyond your screen. Right. See, because what you think you have learned social media, but you actually also have to learn how to be socially. Be how the social, how to, how to interact with the so, with the society, right? Yeah. Like everything is now emoji, yeah. right? So when you meet people, you have to learn how to communicate and speak. When sis said that she walked up to the guy who owned the firm, she didn't say, "Hey, what's up, bud? Let's do some business." She didn't say, "Let me slide your DM." She said, "How can I add value to your company?" That was the first thing. But then the second thing was, "Who can I speak with?" Because I'm assuming you are the boss and you have a lot going on. And I know I have not, not earned the one-on-one the, the -on -one with you yet. But who in your office can I speak to that I can present something to? That whole way she lays it out will make anybody who understands business say, damn, I like that. So yes, be on the screen and learn to be real, to, to become more social with each other and communicate. So I'm happy that you, and this is why you win it too, bro. Because you have learned those things, man. <laughs> And another thing is that, like, when you think about networking, networking is simply relationship building. Who are you building relationships with, and what does that relationship look like? For me, my network 
I consult with my network a lot. So it's not just an opportunity that it's not just an opportunity that I can benefit from, but also maybe I can consult with somebody. What you think about this? Maybe have a thought partner that you can think that, that, um, that you can talk to, because you don't have to figure it out all by yourself. Within your network, it's not just again, it's not about the benefits, but who can you, as the young brother just said, who can be my mentor? Who can I learn from? Who can who is somebody that I can call? Because I'm pretty sure as you've been here throughout this convention, you've done, you've done a lot of networking, but sometimes that networking ends in a place where it essentially was born in. So what are you doing after you get the call? What are you doing after you get that, that, that contact information? How are you following up with them? And you have to establish what that relationship is. All right. Well, I got to tell you, I got $750,000 from a Fortune 500 company and never met the man. Because what I did is I sent him a personal note you remember that thing called mail? <laughs> Come on. Okay. <laughs> I actually ordered stationery in my name and sent him a personal note that I was doing this huge event, um, a part of uh, the Grammys and Oscars, Tinseltown to, to Gotham at Cipriani's oh. here. I said, I need a million dollars to do the event, and I know that you guys have focused on our culture, on black people, oh. and I would like to know how I can contribute to your bottom line for the first quarter by advertising whatever is, is important to you at this event. It's gonna be attended by X amount of people. These are the people I had everybody coming, et cetera. He gave me 700, I'll tell you the company is, Volvo, gave me $750,000 for one event. A personal note. If I can just bring your attention to one point, if you think about, for those of you who all know pharmaceutical sales, it's where an individual goes into these doctor's offices and they try to meet with the doctor. What these pharmaceutical pe what these people do who are in pharmaceutical sales, they understand that if they can get to the, the secretaries, if they can get to the assistants, if they can get to the people whom are close to the people that they want to be close to, that they have a better chance of success. So what do they do? They build relationships with the secretaries, with the people who are in the front desk. Sometimes your success may not be in um, building a relationship with that person, but learn how to build relationships with those people who are around the person that you want to get around. There's more than one entrance into the door, and we have to find different ways of getting, uh, of accomplishing our goals, and one way in doing that is just making sure that we, it, when we can't go for the gusto, when we don't see the person that, uh, you know, holds the key to our success in a, in a restaurant, what do we do? Find out who is around that person that I may have access to. Um, and I find that that has been one of the ways that I have been successful. Thank you, thank you. You guys are making this, this panel amazing. Um, my next question is, you know, in business, we make mistakes, right? But I don't even want to use the word mistakes. I like to, I tell everybody anything you do is a lesson, all right? Mm -hmm. So I want to ask, what are some common lessons that you have faced and you want to tell people now so maybe they can avoid them later? This is for anybody on, on the panel. I never made a mistake. No, <laughs> <laughs> if there's anyone on this panel that, 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 that I'm sure she, she didn't. I'm still learning. But I'm going to tell you, and, 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 that, and, that, and that's really my answer, right? Um, like, look, there's no blueprint, complete blue, blueprint to success, right? Mm -hmm. Um, everyone up here have made individual choices that, and, 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 but those choices came from things that they have learned that we have learned from a culmination of places, things, people, ideas, philosophies, understandings, right? Um, and you're still going to make errors, right? You're still going to, um, it, things not going to always pan out the way you anticipate them panning out. I, I think really for me it is going back to what I initially said, if you have a plan and that plan is clear, um, it's all right to make those mistakes, you know. Uh, sister said in our last statement to keep going. That's key. You have to keep going. Um, set your expectations and your expectations for success. Uh, define what success means to you. And don't define it with money. Don't define it by that house. Don't define it by that car. You know, be clear what success truly is, what love truly is, what happiness truly is, right? And when you, when you, when you kind of center yourself in that, some of the things that you think are mistakes and you think are errors really aren't, you know, really aren't. Uh, one thing I want to say on that, 
be a student in your field. Like he said, it's not really mistakes, it's more so lessons. And right. being an entrepreneur, you're gonna have a lot of lessons along the way. The ups and the downs are gonna be, they're gonna be there, it's life. Entrepreneurship is another part of life, so being a student in your field and learning from those mistakes, because you're going to have them. And beating yourself up and pushing yourself down isn't a way to go about it. You have to kind of change your mindset and redirect the narrative and be, hey, how can I adapt from the situation? Okay, I failed here, what's the next step to get better from that? How can I avoid not doing that again and steps to doing better for the next time? So being a continuous student of your field. I don't care how many years you put into it, how old, how much skin you got in the game, you can always learn something new. So continue to be a continuous student and learning what your field and your craft is because it changes every year. There's always a new thing, something that's trending, something that's popping up. So you always have to learn how to stay relevant, fresh, and new in the market. I think the biggest mistake that uh, that the potential entrepreneurs make is they forget to start. You spend a whole lot of time thinking about preparing and thinking. And you know, people say, I want the perfect A plan. It's going to have all the answers. That's not it. Sometimes you got to take the B, the C plan, but you got to start. You got to jump off the cliff and you got to be committed. And the mistake that a lot of folks that want to be entrepreneurs make is they're afraid to start. You got to start. You have to have to start. And along the way, you're going you're gonna to get beat up. Along the way, oh, I didn't pay my taxes. Oh, man, I don't know how I'm going to make payroll this month. Oh, I don't know am I, how am I going to get the product in, in, the, in the hands of the right people. But you will figure it out. Yeah. Right? Having tenacity, having gumption, having to, to stay with it, to stick to itness is what will make you an entrepreneur. And the other thing that I will say is you've got to learn to love the journey. Yeah. It's not yeah. about the destination. you got to love the journey. The journey is, is the good stuff. That's the stuff that you'd be able to tell your friends about. The reason we're at the panel today is because we've had journeys, and we're sharing with you pieces and parts of our journey, and that's the good stuff. Excellent. Excellent. Anyone else? I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't love the journey. Uh, the journey was too hard for me. Uh, you know, I, as a matter of fact, I've never said this publicly, and my family doesn't know. Um, I, I used to live in Vegas. Uh, Vegas has no state taxes. I moved there for Shout five years because I was making Vegas. so much money I needed to, to chill out, okay? <laughs> so, but but here, here's, here's the deal. I had a $12 million investor that I had worked for eight months getting this together. And the day before, he declared bankruptcy. Mm. So, and I've never told my family this. So everything that I was planning to move to in one day was gone, gone as an entrepreneur. So I moved into my car, and I was homeless. And if any of y'all tell my family, I'll kill you, okay? <laughs> because you know, you always, down south, you always have family you can go back to, and all of them had money, right? But I was so embarrassed, I, I didn't want to go back. So I like, lived in my car outside the Palm Hotel for like a week. <clears throat> Shoes got stolen, everything. Um, so when you talk about the journey, loving the journey, I didn't love the journey. But what I did was, I said, okay, let me get myself together. So when I would go inside the Palm, I would meet people who were like rich and entrepreneurs and doing great. And I would say to them, well, is there anything I can help you with in your office? And they didn't even know that I had this extensive, you know, uh, qualifications and global background and all this other stuff. So within that week, I had three new contracts. Mm. So I never told my family that I was washing up in the bathroom of the Palm Hotel. I'm sorry, it makes me cry now. But I never told them. Come on, sis, but look at that, though. You say you Look at where you at now. Look at, can we, come on, y'all. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You say you didn't love the journey, right? But understand, you went there for one contract and got three. So the journey was necessary. One time for her. Make some noise for her, y'all. This is going out of here. Is. <laughs> That's a blessing. That's the first time I've ever spoken that. Mm. That's your journey. That's your journey. <laughs> Anyone else? So I didn't and love the journey. <laughs> <laughs> And, and in talking about mistakes, Damn. I'm glad she shared something, but um, one of the mistakes I do think we make is allowing sometimes our pride to just getting, getting in the way of allowing us 
to be vulnerable enough to ask for the help that we need. And sometimes we make these things so much harder on ourselves than we have to just for the inability of being vulnerable and asking for the help that we need. You cannot do it alone, and I'm telling you that right now. I know that most of the people up here, like this young man said, that he has the, the assistance of his mom. You cannot build the business alone. You're gonna need some favors. You're gonna need some people um, around you who, if nothing else, just motivate you. Just um, some like minds who you can balance ideas off of and so one of the things that we have to do is just we do have to play the game of what to tell because we don't want to give people enough that they can destroy us right we don't want to be that vulnerable but learning how to keep people around us who we can trust with certain conversations and understanding that sometimes your success lies in with you just being vulnerable and letting somebody know that you need a certain type of help Thank you. You know what? I got to tell you, it's also your presence. Mm. This young man makes me want to help him. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and I'm like, I'm inundated with mm. stuff. I don't even have mm. time to help people. But the first thing I said to him is, you know, do you have a product? What's yeah. your distribution, et cetera? Mm. He makes me want to help him right. because of his presence and his respect and his dignity mm. and the way he presents himself. Mm. So you got to think about all those things when mm. you're an entrepreneur. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Y'all made me share too much. I'm going to shut up. <laughs> um, I want to talk about uh, giving back. So I have a friend of mine, my, one of my Morehouse brothers. He was also the president of the Morehouse uh, NAN chapter, um, Jaden Perpignan. He also created a business, uh, Larry Smashburgers, and he's about to open a, a, a front, a storefront in Atlanta. And he... He called me and he was like, hey, I want to uh, do something with Nan. And so he created it. He said he wants to give out um, about 100 burgers and fries. All he, he'll pay for everything out of his business. He doesn't want um, Nan to pay for anything. He just wanted to just ask for Nan's support to hand them out and give volunteers. And the reason why I said this is because, you know, when you're doing business, you're, you know, people have different ways of giving back, whether it's hiring you know, your own people, whether it's donating, whether it's doing an event like that. And so I wanted to talk to you guys about when you're, you know, you're hustling, you're trying to make your money, how do you give back? And if you can't, how, how can you still, you know, help out? So anybody can, can go. I don't want to keep going. I'll go. You go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if I haven't stated, uh, I volunteer a lot within my Harlem community, mm -hmm. and I do free art classes for senior citizens the youth, um, I give back to my um, Millbank community, uh, that's Dunvali, a children's aid society. Um, I give back to my community, so that's that's how I give back, by just doing free art classes and volunteering however I can. I, I think, yeah, give a round of applause, because You know, we, we have always, we come from a tradition of taking care of us, right? And along the way, we kind of got away from that tradition. Yeah. And, and so we, we find ourselves often, you know, trying to figure out what we can do to kind of give back. But first thing we have to do, I think, is just connect back to the roots, to the essence of who we are as a people. We built this economy. We built this this country. Yep. I'm talking about from the economy to the to, to the architectural layout. Mm -hmm. Came from the hearts and minds and brilliance of Black America. We have the power, and we have been so disconnected from it that now we have to find our way back. Mm -hmm. I would tell you this: economics has always been the issue in this country. It wasn't about black or white. It was about economics. If we do not understand that, we have missed the point. Yeah. So as you build your businesses and you make your money, right. if you do not understand that this is part of a bigger conversation, a bigger movement, then we are missing the point. So it's not about whether you go to your community and give out turkeys or any of that stuff. As long as you are doing what you need to do as, as a family, making sure those economics stay in our community and that black dollar stop leaving the first chance it get, that's how we start 
uh, protecting the economics in our community. That's giving back to me, right? Not necessarily making sure that, that, that and we need uh, uh, food programs, and we need those things happening. But we also need to understand the economics is what's, the, what's running this country. And if we don't play this game, if we don't understand this game, if we don't understand that it is happening on our back, whether or not we make a dime, there's so much money being made of the hearts and blacks of, backs of black people. Whether the prison industrial complex, whether the foster care system, they are making money off of us, whether we realize it or not. So we have to reconnect with the identity of what it is that we are and who we are and understand that economics is the basis and that will free us from a lot of the problems that we are dealing with. Absolutely. Look, thank you, thank you guys so much. We gotta open it up for two. How many questions? Two questions, so please, if you have a question, say it now, if you have two questions. Right there. Come, can you come up? So Alicia, please. Two questions. Two questions. All right, we got our two questions. The question is, what are we doing to combat combat that? Because children, to me, that's the most vulnerable, black children, black and brown children, the most vulnerable, unprotected um, group of people in the world. Zero to five years, forced to care, um, homes in ACS, homes in our families who have these zero to five year old babies so they can produce and get state funding off of them. And 83% of the time, it's just poverty and we need help and resources. But our children are being funneled through the system from foster care to jail. They're being abused, they're being trafficked. The question is, what are we gonna do about that? Because that's important. Well, I would love to talk to you after this panel, but we are working on pieces of legislation right now to address yeah. that because it's like, for instance, in the state of Florida, yeah. when a child max out at the foster care uh, at 18, you give them a bus ticket and send them away. They haven't learned any skills. They haven't created any sort of network beyond what you put them in. And so what you're really doing is setting them up with that bus ticket to go to prison, right? So we are working on federal legislation right now to address that. So after this panel, we can have a conversation outside to talk about that. I just want to say I felt sorry for what she's saying about the okay, foster yeah. care and the prison system. That's something designed for colored, all colored people. Your all question? In. The question is for the whole panel, it's two. Do you give 10% to wherever your church or do you donate 10% of your earnings, whatever the money is that you make when you do your business, do you give 10%? Do you I give 10%? Yes, do you give 10%? I pay my tithes and offerings. And you're a good, you're a good girl. <laughs> it's the sec, the, do do, do y'all do like she do or what? Because the turkey matters to me. Oh, do, I, do, I do it very differently. I'm, I'm from the South. I, I, whether or not I go to the church or not Come or on. attend the church or not, I just do whatever the church needs. And with people even across the world, I do whatever is, is needed, not required of me, but what is needed. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, literally, I've, I've created a, 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 a socks and, and sandwiches uh, event and financed it my entire self for Skid Row in three cities. Mm -hmm. Literally, I've uh, done a closet thing and, and taken it to shelters and basically ordered real food for the shelters. Literally, you know, I just do whatever is needed. I don't, uh, it's not like a, a regimented thing. Wh wherever it's needed, I do it. And um, I've created businesses with people across the world where I've given them the idea to give 2% back to their community. We're doing something huge um, in, in three cities in America right now and also in some African cities with orphanages where whatever the company makes, 3% goes back to the orphanages in their city. So I, I guess that answers your question. Because we have to, we got. People that can take care of all of black America, 
if we all gave, you know, all the, especially a billion. Thank, can get thank you so much. Let's go to our very last question. All right, I, I don't have a question, I just have a statement. I walked in and that's God's grace that I heard something about foster care and just wanted to say we are working on a foster care bill presently. So there is one happening in New York City with the city council members. Kevin C. Riley is actually the one leading the way on that. My name is Anaya A and if you need any help or questions or if you wanna work with us, we have a task force as well where we're working on getting the awareness out there, but also making changes so that we can stop the trafficking of our children. It's a multi-trillion dollar operation. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you guys so much. Um, closing remarks, of course. Let's please keep it as small and quick as possible. This time we're going to start at the other end. All right. Thank you. Oh, my end? Yes. <laughs> um, I, I think I kind of started my closing remarks in the opening, but I just want to say thank you again to the National Action Network for having me here. Thank you to my sisters, Ashley and Dominique. Um, and I just thank you all for being here. You can follow me on Instagram, Christina's Lane. Um, my brand is Shop Christina's Lane. And um, I'm just blessed to be here. Thank you. I'll make this also, make sure to say your name one last time. Make sure. Oh, Christina Lane. Thank you, Christina. I'll make this really quick. Um, I just wrote down some tips for small business owners. Um, basically, to focus, limit your distractions. Don't let anyone take your joy. Stop talking too much. Stop talking too much in the wrong place, places. Stop meeting to meet. You know, If you meet, have a, a certain focus and go to the next step. Stop participating in multiple task, tasks with no action in one. Think omnichannel. Do you know what that means? All the Fortune 500 companies use that word now. It means think about offering a seamless experience at your business, whatever you're doing, whether it's selling a food on a food truck or a product or et cetera. Um, and then study your competitors, know what they're doing, and find your niche. Provide outstanding customer service because they will remember how you made them feel. I've had people come back and tell me, oh my God, I had to find your company again because you made me feel so good. And what that brother said at the end, go in the door that's open to you. I've gotten so many contracts from receptionists, or let, they let, let me know the, the contracts were there, from janitors and receptionists uh -huh. and assistants and chief of staff. Three more things, provide, uh, okay, build a strong team, stay on top of your marketing trends, be passionate about your business, and here's the last thing. Okay? Think out of the box and have fun. Mm. Um, my closing remark is be intentional with your business. Make sure everything you do has a purpose. Don't just do it just to do it. Make sure everything you do has a, a final step and a final product. And my name again is Laurel Weisinger. I am the owner and operator of my business, Chili Barkers. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, or TikTok at Chili Barkers, C H I L Y. Barkers, B-A-R-K-E-R-S. And thank you, Nan, for allowing me to speak and have a rev rest of the afternoon. <laughs> thank you. Uh, my name is Prophet again, Black Music Action Coalition. My closing remarks, I just want to thank Dominique and Ashley again. Um, uh, I, yeah, I started 30 years ago, 13 years old is when I first started coming to Nan and we started Youth Move. And so when I sit and listen to brothers talk about the, the Vegas chapter and the Atlanta chapter, and you know, it, it's really something really special to watch develop for the past 33 years. And it lets me know and us know that the work is still needs to be done. And so when I look at these young people on this panel and who are organizing these events throughout this weekend, you know, I'm very inspired by what I'm seeing and what I'm feeling. So thank you guys for having me. And you can follow me at Profit 5050 or BMA Coalition on Instagram. Thank you. So once again, I'm Harold Hassan Flake um, from Greater Allen out in Queens. And if I have to leave you with one thing, I'm just going to say be relentless. Make it happen. I used to be, I used to take offense when people used to call me relentless until I realized one day that it is my relentlessness that has allowed me to accomplish a lot of the things that I never thought that I could. So just as you're out there, 
be relentless. Don't take no for an answer. If one door closes in your face, you you God will open another one. And if one lane takes you on a curve, create your own lane. Don't be afraid to create your own lane. You can you can reach me at Harold Hassan on Instagram. That's H A R O L D H A S A N on Instagram. Thank you to National Action Network, Dominique, Ashley, Reverend Sharpton. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs> Uh, Derek Lewis, uh, NAACP field manager. First, I want to say thank you to the National Action Network for inviting me. Um, what I want to leave you all with is I know I'm talking to somebody that's in the room. Um, I know that this panel probably touched you, inspired you in some type of way, and you're probably sitting on the fence right now. Like, oh, I had an idea. You've been sitting on, a diff you've been sitting on, this, on this idea for about two years now. It's time for you to start and do it. Um, so whoever I'm talking to, do it. Do it scared. Do it with confidence. And do it in community. Again, my name is Eric Clayette. I'd like to say thank you to the National Action Network for having us. Um, as the executive director of 100 Black Men, we are honored to support the work of the National Action Network. And as a closing remark, I would share with you that nations are built on the backs of small businesses. Amen. Nations are built on the backs of small businesses. And if we want to participate, we want to control resources, we want to do anything, it's about the folks who are controlling the small businesses. So entrepreneurs, entrepreneurism is where it's at. I would encourage you to be entrepreneurs. I encourage you to be relentless, to be fearless, and to jump off the cliff. Right. Thank you. Can, Can we, we give Dominique and Ashley a round of applause in National Action Network? Can we give you guys a round of applause for this amazing panel? Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Um, to close it out, my name is Philippe Dosa. I'm the Youth and College Director. I also have a business. I am the uh, CEO of the Enjoyment Entertainment. I do event consulting. So I just want to say thank you. I took so much wisdom. Let's get a picture, y'all. Thank you. All right. Give them a hand one more time, everybody. We're moving into our next panel. Let them take a picture. Dominique is coming with her panel for this afternoon, and Tatiana is going to help with that. Yes, where are yours? All right, we're coming back on. If you have questions, comments, or concerns, please take it into the hallway. All right, thank you all. If you have comments, questions, let's, let's begin. Let's begin our next panel. Can you turn this one on so I can walk around? Oh. All right, shh. Try to direct the people out to our volunteers and ushers. Well, this ain't church, but to the volunteers and security. If we can try to usher folks out that want to talk. Take them out, this is not on, it's not on. I tried, he, he's not even back there. All right. Excuse me, please, panelists, 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 panelists. Excuse me, sorry. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Before I introduce All right. Thank you. We should be. Whoa. We're good? All right. All right, folks, we're going to begin now for real. So uh, panelists, y'all can come on up. I'm going to introduce Dominique and everybody. 
Um, but y'all come on up, take your seats. I'm gonna ask that folks would start being quiet. Who's that? What happened to where is your tent card? I had it yesterday. You did, and I don't know where it went. But we had an extra That's one for you. I don't know. What is it? All right. What happened? Oh, I put one on the table and he has the other one in his hand. So you gotta find it. All right. Thank you all. We are getting ready to begin. In one minute, we don't need these. All right. <clears throat> Shh. Let's start selling it down, folks. I know we're excited. We are at our third panel of the afternoon. It has been a very festive day on today. All right, we're going to begin. I'm going to call up the panelists at this time. I'm going to ask that everybody will be seated. Um, if everybody will take their seats at this time, we're going to begin. Shh. Folks that are in the back, I need you guys to exit the room, please. We cannot have any noise or talking in the room while the panel is going forth. Come, King. Sorry. All right, so now uh, this panel is our third panel for this afternoon. We had our first panel, yes. which was on um, artivism. Then we had, during that time, at the same time, we had our criminal justice panel going forth. Okay. Uh, then after that, we just got finished with our entrepreneurship panel. Now we are going into our policy panel. And we have some great people that are up here. We have our great moderator for today. Give Dominique Sharpton a hand. <laughs> Dominique oh, is going to be. That's like really, 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 yeah, yeah, really yeah, bad. <laughs> <laughs> and we have her co-moderator. I don't know where she just went. Tatiana from our Las Vegas chapter. Y'all give Tatiana a hand. Come on up here, Tatiana. She stepped out, but she's coming right back in. Okay, so I'm, uh, Dominique is going to introduce everyone. Um, James Johnson, am I right? What's his name? James Johnson, I'm going to ask that you guys pray for him. Uh, he was on our panel, but is unable to make it because he had death in his family. So we're going to ask that you guys will continue to uplift him in prayer. Uh, but this panel is on policy. And each individual that is up here are young in their field. Uh, and so we are so glad to have each of them, but Dominique will go forth in that. Give Dominique and the panelists a hand one more time as they go forth in our policy panel. Good All afternoon, right. everyone. Thank you, Christian, for um, that introduction. I hope that everyone has been uh, very inspired and uplifted as I have been uh, working and to help coordinate this convention over the past four days. Um, and it's very um, honorable for me to stand before you uh, this afternoon to moderate this panel because it is very near and dear to me. Um, it is definitely something and a subject uh, that we continue to discuss over time, um, but we don't really come to the table a lot to uh, allow some of the leading youth voices to, uh, to really advocate and speak on uh, where we are currently in this country and to come together in such a a space and a setting as we are literally setting the action agenda towards how we will move forward uh, in this time. And we're dealing with so many issues and we've been talking about them all week um, as we continue to work uh, tirelessly in our respective roles as advocates, as change makers, uh, as people of influence, as people of color. And we really need to understand our role and understand the magnitude of our power in this moment. So I'm very, very, very um, honored and blessed and grateful to be able to stand before you and moderate this panel this afternoon, um, speaking with some very dynamic uh, young voices, uh, young leaders uh, in this space uh, to really challenge and deal with where we are today. And of course, the chart 
uh, for of how we chart the steps and actions forward. Um, so I want to introduce our panelists today. Um, standing, uh, sitting right next to me, uh, we have Christian Hall uh, and Christian. <laughs> yeah, come on, give it up, y'all. Yeah. Clap it up. <laughs> uh, Christian is a really a man of many different uh, hats that wears many different hats, but uh, he was a former uh, school board rep, Asbury Park, New Jersey, um, and he is uh, a dynamic uh, young leader, young advocate for change, uh, activist in the community, uh, a part of our Asbury Park, New Jersey chapter, really great organizer, um, so many things. So, Christian, uh, thank you for joining us. Next, we have um, is this Khalil? Brother Khalil Anderson. Uh, he's a New York State <laughs> Assembly member. And next to Khalil, we have, yes, clap it up, y'all. Yeah, 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 yeah. Next to Khalil, uh, we have uh, Brother Clement James Jr. He's the senior advisor to uh, U.S. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. Give it up for CJ. <laughs> next to CJ, we have my link sister. <laughs> <laughs> now, y'all, this is how we do. I literally told my sister, Bina, I said, look, I'm going to pull you up on this panel um, because I really think that her voice is uh, prominent and uh, definitely wanted her to lend her voice in this space. Uh, give it up for Abina Billups. Uh, she's the co-founder of Salute Selma. And we were just in Selma celebrating 59 years of, of course, the commemoration of Bloody Sunday uh, as so many individuals march for our voting rights from Selma to Montgomery. And Abina coordinates uh, the commemoration efforts uh, every year and throughout the year uh, in the festivities of how we salute Selma. She's also the Vice President of Governmental Affairs at Talladega College. Give it up for Abina Billups. And next to Abina, we have our uh, policy director from Washington, D.C. of Health and Wellness, Sister Alicia Butler. Please give it up. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. I'm just losing myself here. And then next to um, Alicia, we have Brother Jordan Stockdale. And Jordan is the chief of staff to Manhattan's district attorney, Alvin Bragg. So, uh, Tatiana, I wanted you to come and um, speak. I know that you are from Las Vegas, and this is one of our young prominent voices um, from the West Coast. So I wanted you to open up this panel and really just kind of lay out where we are, where you see things, and how uh, we as young people really need to be involved and very dedicated to how we are focused on uh, policies and how protest affects policy for change. Please give it up for Tatiana. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tatiana. I'm the president of the Las Vegas chapter of the Youth Division. Um, thank you, Dominique, for having me up here. Um, for one, I want to say as change and with the youth that we wanted to do and we are doing, and I love all these panels, so you guys, thank you for coming out this eve. Um, I guess it's afternoon. But as far as this one, what we do in the Las Vegas division, we are doing more involvement with the kids and our youth, getting them more involved with the politicians. Um, Nevada is a big state for changes and besides um, DC and New York, but the policy and changes, you got to get to get them to know the people that are making the changes. And if they don't know, if they're not involved, um, we have a kickball game that we did and our, our youth lost. Now they want to rematch. <laughs> But it now when they get older, they can say, hey, I, pl um, I played with Judge Cooper. I played with Assemblywoman um, Chandra. I played with these people, and now they know when, who, if something's going wrong, the policy is there to be changed, and they know who to talk to now. It's not just so I see them on the news. No, like we said before, you got to have rapport with them. And if we're not showing the kids how to make rapport, because we say go talk, but we're not teaching our kids. So with us teaching them, meet them where they're at. Like the first panel said, meet them where they're at. Kickball games, social media, get them involved, come to the meeting. So changing the policy, meeting them where they're at, not, not against what old school, but we have to be present with what we need to do and how we need to do that. So changing the, po the policies, introducing them to the people who make the policy changes. So that's why we introduce with um, Las Vegas and hopefully all the other um, Groups are doing it as well, but we introduce our kids to the people who make the changes in the policies. Um, if I have two, two other seconds, this week, and I know this is by the grace of God, this week my son was not supposed to be here on this panel that just ended. And we went through with the definition of the system stopping black men and women. 
my son, it's rules, I can't, get in, I can't get into full details, but they were striving to stop my son and told him if he missed coming to school this Saturday, they were gonna give him an F, kick him out of his scholarship, they were going to take everything that this young man worked for. He is an AP, AP honor, and they told him if he did not come because he has A's and B's the whole year, he was gonna get an F, it was gonna stay on his record, and he would miss out on everything that was promised to him. You mean to tell me if he misses one day, you're gonna give this young man an F? But I said, and I get this from Dr. Glover, oh, he met the right one. They, show, they met the right one. And mom went from the attendance office to the assistant, to the principal, to the front desk, and they, they messed up saying, the only person that can do it is the principal. And I said, something's not right. And guess where I went? To the principal's office, because the policies need to be changed. And if we don't do it for our black and brown kids, nobody. They had, they text my son and said they had over 300 students and half of them didn't show up today. So now half of them are gonna get Fs. E exactly. Not bring them a grade down, not help, but they're giving them Fs for not showing up. So I said, after this is done, we are gonna figure out how to make a change. I can't change everything, but I know for my kid, they done, they done met the right one. So if we do not start with knowing who to talk to and get these policies changed, it's gonna keep happening. So get your kids, get your youth to know who the people are that are changing these policies. Thank you. What a very powerful statement to open up this panel. We're gonna jump right into it because as Tatiana said, we, got, we have some issues to discuss. And we understand that demonstration is important. Uh, we are a National Action Network, uh, an organization that believes in taking action and we believe in um, really from demonstration to legislation and how that trajectory looks um, and how they work hand in hand and how us continuing to stay on the front lines, pushing for change, advocating for our issues that are important to us, how that should affect legislation ultimately. So young leaders of today and leaders of tomorrow, um, what do you feel if you had to identify some of the political issues, some of the policy issues that we as people of color should be raising and advocating for, what would you pinpoint as being the top priority ones? We know that, yes, we care about education and equality. Yes, we care about health care and equality. Yes, we care about voting rights. There are so many things that we care about, criminal justice reform. But as young people, if you had to create a statement and you were talking to a, you know, a classroom full of teenagers, and they asked you, well, what's the main thing that we should be focused on if you were to choose one of the top issues that we should be focused on in terms of affecting policy? How would you outline that and what would that look like? Uh, I'll start with Jordan at the end because I see you shaking your head down there. So you got something to say. I mean, I got, I got a lot of different thoughts on this. <laughs> but I'll, I'll try to be brief here. I'm a former educator, former teacher in East Harlem. So I always go to education <laughs> as, as the first item. Um, we have to have better access to quality education. That's number one. Uh, schools, their budget is largely tied to, and this is nationally, largely tied to the local property taxes. We know we have disparities in, in home ownership and home values. And so from the jump, we know that schools are going to have very vast different budgets, which means the quality of education is going to be very different throughout their entire lifetime. So we need to change the formula where local schools are paid primarily through local property taxes. That has to change, so that's number one. Uh, number two, we need affordable housing. We have way too many families that are spending over 50% of their income on housing. That means the parents have to work multiple jobs, can't be home as much, can't supervise as much. We need more affordable housing. I go on and on, but I know we got a big panel, so I want other people to be able to talk, but affordable housing, access to get education, and a fair criminal justice system. All right, that was good. So fair, affordable housing, fair criminal justice system, and what was the third one? Uh, quality, access to quality education. Access to quality education. Okay, Abina, you were gonna, okay. Okay, yeah. Um, again, education would be top of my list, um, especially in the state of Alabama. There has been horrendous um, legislation that has been signed by the governor that's taken away DEI and public um, schools as far as um, if you wanna go to college and you know K through 12. So education 
would be my top concern because we know that there's a prison in the pipeline. They're removing these affirmative action, diversity and equity and inclusion um, it laws so that they can build more prisons. So criminal justice reform as well as education are my top. Okay, does anyone else wanna take that question? I think I would speak to mental health. Right now, the mental health mm -hmm. rates are spiking specifically for young people. We are not okay and we have not been okay at least for the past four years since COVID. Mm -hmm. And so we need to expand access to mental health services while also ensuring that young people have access to health insurance that covers it. Because we also don't have a lot of money. We are <laughs> in a complete era of we're in a recession, to be honest, and there's inflation, there's all of these things that are making it harder to have access to a better quality of life for young people. We are not buying houses at the same rate that we used to, and we are just now becoming of age to do all of those things. And so all of those things are a combination that are impacting our mental health and our mental wellness. And so I think that that is our top priority. If we are not okay, we can't do anything for anyone else or anything else. Mm -hmm. I, if nobody else wants to answer, I want to just add on to this question because as we're talking about these issues and we're identifying these issues, um, I think we also need to tap into our, our political power and how can we collectively do that in order to challenge and fight these issues that we're talking about? Christian? So I'll answer that immediately, then I'll talk about the other question. Okay. So as far as the political... Um, I would suggest us using the, the, the machines that we already have in place, whether it's church, whether it's the National Action Network, whatever organizations that we have in our communities, use, utilize them so we can organize and divide, uh, come up with a plan on how we're going to move forward. And when I say that, I mean as far as picking who it is who's going to go forth and, and represent us, who we're going to vote for. Too many times when we have these elections, we end up splitting votes. We'll have five black people over there <laughs> running for yes. on one ticket, and then you got two over there voting on one ticket, and you end up causing the community to have to divide their votes. Mm. And what happens is, when you're on a board of ed, you need, or any boards, um, you have to have a majority vote. Now, if you go in with your full ticket of four, five or three people, all of these people, you're, you know they're going to vote um, like-minded with you. But if you have somebody that's split from another ticket, they're not going to vote with you. You lose the majority vote. Now the community loses. Mm -hmm. So we have to organize and decide as a community first, before those elections come, who will be putting in place. We do our own, uh, whether you call it a debate, whatever, and handle that in-house first. And then we move forward organized. I don't want to take too much of your time. Okay, question. I can clap to that. Thank you so much, Dominique, for the question. And let's just give a big round of applause to Nan. All right. Yeah. I'm really grateful for this convention each every year and an opportunity to speak. So being a local elected official uh, representing parts of Queens, I understand the importance of hearing and listening to my constituents, the people that I represent. And one of the ways in which I hear them more effectively if, if, they're, if they're organized. And so what does that organizing look like? It looks like taking a single issue or a collaborative of issues and saying and staying consistent on those issues, whether it means writing letters, whether it means sending emails, whether it means making phone calls. And we have seen us staying consistent on that one issue or collaborative of issues uh, move the goalposts and move things forward. Just take my election in 2020 when we saw the rise of the George Floyd protests and the need for more police accountability, we saw many people go to the polls and were motivated behind those issues because that's the issue that our community said, this is our moment and this is our time to organize around it. So I would say it's about us staying focused and it's about us picking that one issue or collect collective of issues and staying on it for as long as possible. Yep. Anyone else? Yep. Yeah. I'll say that um, it's important to show up. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes we get upset and frustrated by the laws that are passed. It's because we didn't show up. We have to show up on lobby days, community board meetings, and also remember that all legislation and uh, legislation and policies are local. Uh, we don't show up to vote. We complain more than we show up. So it's important to galvanize the community to come together, 
to knock on your elected officials' doors. They have office hours. Go to the nation's capital. Go to the state's capital. Go to City Hall. Protest. Come together and come up with a plan. And that way, you can affect change. The same way we got the George Floyd Act was because people around the world came together and the elected officials heard the voice. We have the voice. We have to continue to speak up and speak out to impact and affect change. We also have to be informed and know who to direct the energy to and who to hold accountable. We cannot be mad at certain elected officials that have no power. There is a balance of power in the government for a reason, so no one has absolute power. We have to know who to hold accountable, what are the issues that matter, and then who do we look to and what that looks like. We cannot just continue to spew misinformation. It's counterproductive. So direct the right energy to the right people, um, you know, and I'll, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Anybody else? No? Okay. I got All right. some. I got some. No, you do? Okay. Okay. Um, so I was thinking, um, to, piggy, to piggyback off of what you were saying, we have to educate our voters on the structure of politics. So, for instance, with my daughter, I teach her with the Board of Education. She needs to understand that the teachers and the entire Board of Education, all the staff, they are here to work for you. Uh -huh. They get paid with you being in those seats. If you're not there, they don't get paid. And too many times we have teachers, I was even a student where I was told, oh, I make money, or I've already got my education, I don't care what's going on. These kids gotta know that they can hold these people accountable. Everybody has someone to answer to. So like with your, with your situation, if it's, the, if it's the, pr the principal and they're not being compliant, they're not uh, answering your questions or ducking you, you have the superintendent. If it's not the superintendent who's not compliant, you have the Board of Education. The Board of Education usually has a state or county uh, board that's, that's over them. So everybody has someone to, uh, to answer to, and we have to educate our voters on that. I was praying I didn't have to get that far, but. Yeah. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we're here for. Oh, also, wow. I believe that we need to implement law and public safety classes. For instance, like when we talk about, um, what's his name, um, Eric Gardner. When we talk about rape, putting our hands up and saying don't shoot, we have to know how to uh, respond with the police when we come in contact with them. We also need to know the laws, because they come up to us and we don't know the law, we don't know our rights. So we need to make sure that these Board of Educations are implementing that in the curriculum and teaching our kids. We have to start with education. The mental health part, one of the things I wanted to implement in the Board of Education was that I wanted to have a uh, clergy member of whatever you, anybody's religion may be to be present for the staff and for the students throughout the day. Too many times the kids coming from broken homes and backgrounds, you have teachers also coming from homes and broken homes and uh, bad backgrounds, and they come to their school and we're met with tension Trigger. immediately. Trigger now, if you had somebody that you can speak to and not feel like with the, when the teacher's in, you don't feel like the, uh, the principal or anybody is going to give you backlash for what you have to say or a student feeling embarrassed about their issues, they can go to this person, discuss that, and turn that thing around and have a better day. I, we, I, uh, I'm not, uh, okay. I got a couple more. Oh, okay. <laughs> <I just did. laughs> so we have uh, also the issue of gentrification. In, a, in our black communities, we're noticing a lot, lady, a lot lately how all of our hood areas, for lack of a better term, are being bought up. They're buying them at a low price, flipping them, raising the rent and everything, and getting us up out of there, even with the low-income housing. So we have to get on top of that. My idea to get on top of that is back to the education piece in the school system, teaching our kids financial literacy and making it cool to have home ownership. We have to learn how to get a mortgage, how to get a loan, learn about credit. We need to teach that early on. It's amazing how we all see our kids can utilize a phone and a tablet at the youngest age of maybe one or two years old. It's never too early for our kids to learn these things. And so many times these people have taught our kids that it's too early, you're too young to learn that. No, they can learn about credit. I'm teaching my son financial literacy right now. That's it. I'm sorry. What did, you, what did you have to say? I, I just wanted to say what's very important also in policy decisions is the old fashioned, write it. You have to write it. Emails are good, but if you put it on paper and put it in the mail with a stamp, nine times out of 10, they're gonna open it, read it, and respond to you. Mm -hmm. With emails, they get so many emails. 
that you just go into the clutter. But if you take the time to write your issues and flood them with written, you know, documents, as well as evidence, you're going to get a response. So not only just knowing the system, being able to letter write, and it doesn't matter if you put it, you know, if you handwrite it, if you type it, write it, put it in the envelope and mail it. That often, as you know, my grandmother would say, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Right. When, once you write it and then you show up and then you just do the old marketing trick, oh, you, you haven't responded to my letter, you may not have written it, but you can do that. That puts that person on guard to want to say, oh, I apologize, what was it? So you want to do that and we want to teach our young to do that because they don't know how to write a letter now. They don't mm. know how to get a stamp and they don't know how to address the envelope. So those things are very important that we pass that down and that we ensure that you learn how to write and the writing is going to get more information. You use the social media to amplify what, you're, what you've written about but that is how we ensure that those people that are in these positions that my brother to my left has talked about, that they're responding to us. If you want to pick it, oh, okay. okay. I want to add to that. So again, with my experience being on the Board of Ed, I've been there to witness where people that look just like me and you They'll be banking on us not showing up to the meetings. Like my brother to the right stated, you have to show up. If you don't show up, they'll be saying, oh yeah, they don't care anyway. So show up to these meetings, hold them accountable face to face. They wanna get voted back in, you're the voters. You have the power. Hold these people accountable in person, go up to the Board of Ed meetings. Like my sister said, write a letter, write an email, keep a paper trail. Don't always have your conversations verbal. If you do have a verbal conversation, follow up with an email reiterating everything that was stated in person. Hold that paper trail. Okay, um, I'm gonna give y'all a quick breath. I'm gonna read this question. <laughs> okay, so um, as we know, technology, um, everybody's an activist. Everybody gets a platform to speak and do what they need to do. But what role do you see technology and social media playing in shaping the political discourse within the black community? And how can it be utilized to amplify voices and drive change you have a good and bad to social media so how do you guys see that in the pol um, political side i think uh social media is a great tool in the respects of the george floyd police act mm -hmm. right that was able to get passed but also social media can be a negative tool as well right uh people will make a hashtag and write, tweet, Instagram, and TikTok about issues that concern the black and brown community, but when it's time to put boots on the ground, they're nowhere to be found. Mm. And so we have positive organizations like NAN that are great with technology and also will show up on the ground. So we lack the ability of coming behind our computers and Twitter fingers and showing up. Mm. So it's important to, yes, tweet, Yes, shine a light on the issues that plague our communities, but also behind the tweeting, we have to show up and grab a sign and protest and knock on doors because that it's a two-part uh, solution to this problems that we are facing in our communities. Yeah. I think, uh, and thank you again, Tatiana, for the question. I think social media is a critical, critical tool. Just like my brother uh, Clement said, it's a critical tool that can be used in a good way. It also can be yielded uh, in, in, in a negative way. And so when we use social media, it can be used as a tool to organize. It's an organizing space. You can use it for call to actions. You can use it for information dissemination. You can use it for a variety of different things. And so when I think about how effective social media was in my time organizing before becoming an elected official, um, looking at Superstorm Sandy that took place and, and ravaged many of our communities. Mm -hmm. When we put out a call to action on our social medias that, hey, you know, we have very limited electricity and very limited access to the internet, 
where we are in parts of the Rockaways and parts of Queens and a part of, of the city, we need you all to donate. We need you all to come out. And people showed up and donated and they came out. That was an organizing tool that was used in a positive and effective way. But then we have seen it used in a negative way, where we have keyboard warriors and uh, Twitter gangsters and internet gangsters, those folks who will hide their hand and not be as uh, active and engaged uh, and following up with the things that they say that they are representing or they're fighting for. And so that's really important to be able to distinguish between someone who is using the tool as an organizing method uh, but or folks who are just keyboard folk, folk that like to hide behind the keyboard. I, I would just add that we have to be careful with social media now, especially as AI is developing. Yeah. We're finding so many um, discourse and misinformation that's being placed out. So organizations like the National Action Network, NAACP, Salute Selma, those are organizations that you can look to to ensure that you're vetting the information that you're hearing. Mm -hmm. Just because somebody has um, a million likes or a thousand likes and shares on social media, I always try to vet before I share. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that these sources and, and, and whatever this is has some type of um, validation because we can be sharing and information is being poured into us to be divisive. And we just want to make sure that we are, as my um, grandmother would say, check twice, cut once before we hit the share button. Just because they're, I mean, they want to, and we know who the days are, to continue to divide us. <laughs> And um, this is a very, 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 probably one of the most critical seasons that we've been in in a very, very long time. So um, seeing, you know, being an HBCU um, executive, being an HBCU alum, I'm just very, very <laughs> pissed off that you're using these AI bots to cr create people that look like us that are in support of you, especially from, I, I'm an alum of Spelman College, and you're using my AUC <laughs> to say that they're in support of you. Mm -hmm. Be careful. So that's where things are um, that I, I look at social media as can harm us, mm -hmm. but it's also a great tool for call to action. I think social media can be a really powerful tool, but it's also a billion dollar industry yeah. that's made to addict you to your phone. And they hire psychologists, they do test trials, they look at all the ways possible to addict you to your phone so you're looking at it nonstop, mm -hmm. right? And I think a lot of the mental health challenges we're seeing in our young people is the inability to be present. They're so addicted to their phone that when they experience something they love, they're thinking about how do I capture that for an external audience as opposed to how does it really benefit me right now? So, so I, I think it's a powerful tool, but I also think social media activism alone, absent boots on the ground, absent regular convening, is all really ephemeral. We've seen a lot of that, uh, of some of the work that came out of social media post-George Floyd disappear, right? But it's the organizations that actually have boots on the ground that convene on a regular basis that are still here, that are still fighting. And so I don't think we should replace you know, in-person activism for social media. And I, and I have to say, um, growing up in Selma and being an activist, I was never the one that um, went out. Um, I, I wasn't at the protests, you know, but I was the one behind the scenes organizing the protests. I was the one on the phone calling everybody. I was the one ensuring that you need to be here, you need to be there. You find what you're very, very good at. However, my sister, my co-founder that's in the audience, Katrina Norris Carter, she was out there in your face doing the things that um, we need to do as far as being boots on the ground. So again, everybody has to find their niche, what they're very, very good at. Yeah. 
And when you're very good at you do that to ensure that the movement is done, I'm the one that will go to the state legislature and to the White House and into the halls of Congress and get that meeting with whoever I need to and stay on the pulse to ensure that that particular congressperson or senator is listening to us. I'm not the one that's gonna walk out there. So find your niche, make sure you stand on that, and then we will make sure the things that we need changed are changed. I think just to add something really quick, social media is twofold. I think to reiterate, yes, it is used for great ways to organize, call to actions, and to really amplify things that we may not know about in other times, but I also think it is dangerous when it comes to platforming the wrong people and putting out the wrong messages. Okay. And the scary part about social media is once it's out there, it's out there. And a lot of people are in the age where they're more committed and invested into finding ways and points to validate what they believe versus the truth. And so I think using discernment and ensuring that the right people are amplified and platformed and deplatforming the wrong people. That's true. Anyone else? No? Okay. Um, next question. Oh. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, so the next question is, what are your, um, let me make sure I got it right. Okay, what are your thoughts of the role of allyship and coalition building with other marginalized communities in advancing an in interest of black Americans? <laughs> Interesting that you asked that question. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. So the question in short, just how, basically how you wanna build, um, build other connections with other communities, not just NAM, just, just to make it short, I know it's a few words that snatch it. How would you guys, how would you guys build other connections with other organizations, not just NAM, if that, that makes sense? So interesting that, it's great that you um, posed that question um, because that has been um, on Katrina and I's dialogue and in conversation for a long time we first I, I just have to say this we have to get out of the our way um, so many times we want to be so heard <laughs> and we're so broken <laughs> we want to be the person that you know although I call this person to connect with Nan I want to be the person on the stage and I gotta have the mic because I was just my idea so what <laughs> You know, and once we get out of our way, it's okay to partner with others because yes. the only way that we are able, the only way that we're able to assimilate is if we link together. Yes. That's the only way. If we don't link together, we just one margin over here and then we're fighting because I got this further along, that's what they want. And you got that further along. So if we're able just to link, get out of each other's way, make everybody great, you can have the stage, you can have the stage, it doesn't matter who name is first, as long as my black son isn't murdered again. <laughs> as long as my black daughter isn't raped again. That's right. <laughs> as long as my grandmother is eating <laughs> and nobody's abusing her, because there's elder care that we have to talk oh, about yeah. amongst us, okay? So partnership, allyship is very important, but the first thing, the lemon squeeze needs to be, we have to get out of the way. What's the issue? Are we going to band together on the actual issue and work the issue to ensure that we all eat? I think coalition building is very important. When you, I'm a proud member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Okay. And when you look at the D9, and once the D9 came together and other organizations like the Lynx, the Masons, the Boulets, uh, we have power uh, to change an election. Uh, they all rally behind Kamala Harris to become the vice president and to help Joe Biden become president. 
So it's important to get together with organizations, even church organizations and civic organizations, come together. Like a, my sister Bina said, is that we sometimes get in our own way mm -hmm. by having one person wanting to be at the head. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to learn to come together as a cohesive movement to really impact and affect change. That's it. Anyone else? Yeah. Okay. Anyone else after him? Because then we'll, after that, we're going to get to the crowd. Okay, you'll I'll, be the last one. Oh, you want to go after? Say one thing. No, um, I'll let him go first because he was, oh. and then I'll let you go after him. Yes. Okay. Then go in order. All right, so to piggyback off of what you guys were just saying, um, we have to humble ourselves as organizations. We all have the power and strength in numbers. If we join together rather than being separate, like the sister said, oh, no, my church, A and me, you know, we doing it. Man, everybody join together because we all sitting here failing at the same dog on time. We can sit here and argue in the room next to each other or help each other. You, either you're part of the solution or you're part of the problem. You got to pass the torch. Teach each person. You got to teach somebody to take your position. Whether you're on the board of it, whether you're on the city council, whether you're the president at your job, whether you're cooking fries, you got to teach somebody to take your spot. Encourage your children to join the debate team with city council. I mean, not the city council, the debate team or the, um, the student team. council. Student yeah. council. What I implemented on my Board of Education was that I wanted the student council and the debate team to be able to sit next to us at the Board of Ed meetings so they can learn exactly what we're doing, they can come back when they're of age and take our seats, and they can also go home and communicate everything to their parents. It also encourages the parents to come out to the meetings to see their child. Bring the children to the protests. As me, Ashley, and Dominique were raised, we were raised being in these protests. We marched with our parents. They, the kids should be in these seats filling them up just along with us. Yeah. They need to be at all the meetings, hearing everything. That's how we're so intelligent or so well-versed with these things because we were raised in it. Yeah. Don't leave all the work to the organization. A lot of times people say, oh, Reverend Al got it. Let him go. Yeah, brother, you got it. Go ahead. Good job. And then you're sitting at home. We need more people. We need people next to us. A lot of us are tired, too. You think we want to get up on Saturdays or Friday or whatever, a whole week and go spend our time down at D.C. margin? No, come bring it behind there with us. We fighting for you, too. Jesus. Fight with us. Yeah. There's work to be done by each one of us in the movement. Don't ever feel like, oh, I can't do nothing. Oh, I ain't smart. I ain't go to school. I grew up over here. There's a job for everybody. Everybody, everybody got a job. The same way they say in church, you're a part of the body. Everybody's a part of the body when it comes to this movement. Say so. so don't ever feel discouraged. All right, our last one. We can yes, stop you. there. Oh, you, yeah. <laughs> you want to drop the mic? Okay, amen. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, we, uh, if you guys can line right here, and we will let you guys. Please uh, remember when you get up here, just a question. It's questions, please. Right. Q&A. So come right here. We're, I'm going to ask that you will be brief. Do I have any young people in here? The uh, Latrell, why I keep calling you DJ? Larell. Larell, do you mind coming to hold the mic for me? I have to run out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, please be brief in your questions because we have another panel right behind this, and so we want to give them time. Like our president says, like the Grammys, you only get a certain amount of time. <laughs> Short and sweet. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for this important panel. Um, I'm a member of NAN, but also have a nonprofit that focuses on water equity. Um, we have a youth council, and um, one of the things, it's a new council, so I think they're still trying to learn their limitations because we are a 501c3 also, but they wanna work on policy. I wanna ask, what are the limitations when it comes to a nonprofit working on policy? I know that we have to work with someone um, that's uh, an elected official, but wanted to understand maybe the limitations on uh, what can we do and what can't we do as a 501c3. So as a 501c3, if you are, um, there's a difference between a 501c3 and a 501c4, right? So you can write policy. Most of the policies that are um, done, they come from nonprofits, okay? They come from um, regular people that are in this room. I'm working on a, a, a legislation right now in the state of mm -hmm. Alabama surrounding medical cannabis, okay? And um, with that legislation, there was some things that were happening, but I put my comments, and you just submit your comments 
and you submit what you want to see that policy to look like. So you can write policy, whatever your niche is. That it, it, there's no rules as far as who writes policy. It's who passes the policy, mm -hmm. who's willing to take your policy and expand it and introduce it as a bill, okay? So you, you can write the policy. You just got to get the support of the, the lawmakers to ensure that it's, it goes through the legislative process. The only thing I would, I'll add is uh, as a leader of a nonprofit, it's important to build relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, when your elected officials are having events, community events, meetings show up, get to know their staffers. The key to getting legislation and things passed is the staffers. The elected official is the head of the uh, office, but the key is learning the staffers. The staffers are, will be the ones to keep you updated, uh, let you know where the legislation is being tracked, um, so I wouldn't say there's limitations. However, the only limitations you may have is not showing up, right? And I keep saying showing up over and over and over again, but it's important to build those relationships, go to the caucus weekends, go to, uh, whatever organizations they're having community events, just continue to show up. You can't lobby with it. No. no. Cannot. I'll let the elected official up here uh, answer that part. If you have a C4, <laughs> you can lobby. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. yeah. If you have a C4, you can lobby. But they're very, your um, nonprofit 501C3 will be penalized and charged if you lobby. However, if there's an issue under your C3 that you want to lobby for, then you need to organize that as a C4. Um, so that you can lobby. But e each state has its rules on lobbying. And so you have to be registered and you have to know what state you're in to know those particular rules. But I do know federally, 501c3s, that your organization is the people's organization. That's why it's a C3. However, a C4, um, that was created so that you can do your packs and your lobbying and all those things that you see are going on right now. All right. Um, okay, we can go to the next question, please. I have observed that the most powerful people are those who have identified and are living their life purpose, the reason they were born in the first place. So my question is, how can we have our people as an organization, as a collective, as a race, be living our life purpose for the rest of our life? I, I think that for me, one thing that I was thinking about as I was going through my, I like to call it a quarter life crisis, because um, I'm still in my 20s, is identifying what you do for free and running with that. That was the best way for me to really lean into all of the things that I wanted to do um, finding ways to make a profit from your passion, but letting the passion lead and not the profit. And so that's the only thing I would say to that. And my, one of my favorite quotes is, be fearless in the pursuit of what sets your soul on fire. And so really, really, really putting your all into the things that matter the most to you and seeing ways in which you can impact people um, through the work that you want to do. So um, I'm from Selma, Alabama. <laughs> I have had the, um, the pleasure of living in South Africa. I practiced law in Tokyo, Japan. Um, I taught in um, a high school. Um, I, I've done so many things. And I remember questioning, I, 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 from self, I, I would leave, I would live out of the country, I would come home, and then I would leave, I moved up here to New York, then God would bring me back to Selma, then I will leave and I'll go to DC. And when I was in Japan, I'll never forget, the um, founding partner of the law firm said, come take a walk with me. And he says, I, I remember when I got your application to work for this firm that um, I chose your, you because you're from Selma, 
when in 1965, I was a student at Harvard. And while I was at Harvard, my English wasn't very, very well. I was, you know, studying law, learning English, but I saw what happened in Selma meant for the world and for me. And um, he says, it's great that you're able to understand Japanese and you know, my area is trademark law, patent. And he says, it's, it's great that you've been able to help us. However, I didn't choose you to be here in Japan forever. You need to go home. <laughs> and he wasn't saying that I had to leave. He just says that my legacy was at home. And so as I got older, and like I said, I run from Selma. You know, I came here, <laughs> I went to DC, I've gone all these places, right? And I'm, I'm running, but it always pulled me back to Selma. And then finally I acquiesced to say, I'm supposed to be in Selma because I'm supposed to ensure that the legacy of Selma is not forgotten. That everything that we do is centered in the vote. So we have to be obedient and listen to that voice that speaks to all of us. That voice that's speaking to you right now. We have to be obedient to that. And once we concede and are obedient, then what we do with that passion, as you say, or that purpose, it, it arrives and it's so clear and everything aligns. So um, obediency is, is very important, being obedient. Thank you, thank you. Yes, like she said, obedience is number um, is number one. We uh, we asked if you guys can give thirty second closing remarks. Um, thirty second closing remarks. Say your name, I'll something yield. motivational, and where they can find you. Answer those four things. Thirty seconds. We can, we can go in order. So we'll start down there to here. So we'll start down there. So your name, something motivational, and where they can find you. All right. Jordan Stockdale again. Thank y'all for being here. I think being here, convening. Is, is half the battle, right? Uh, we need to be involved in organizations that meet on a regular basis, uh, that, that educate the community, and they have the power to fight. Uh, so thank y'all for being here. I'm not on social media, so. Or just if, if they can email you, if you have oh, any yeah, kind of y'all can email me. It's uh, stockdale.jordan at gmail.com. Thank you. Alicia Butler, National Action Network, Health Policy Advisor, and I, uh, your name, something motivational, how to contact you. Mm, something motivational. I think just continue to lean into your passion and do the things that you love and ensure that you are being people driven and people focused. Um, and yeah. Where to find, where to contact you? Oh, sorry. Um, my, oh, my Instagram is gotta love Lisi. Uh, <laughs> G-O-T-T-A-L-O-V-E-L-I-C-I. -E -I. Thank you. So I normally, when I'm on panels or women panels, I always say when I enter into the room, I take my sisters with me, I take my brothers with me. So that's my, um, to you, when I enter into the room, I believe in taking you with me. Um, you can follow us on social media, Salute Selma, Salute Selma, all platforms. And to follow me, I'm B. Billups. So that's B. I. Billups on all platforms. Thank you. Uh, first, just want to say thank you to the moderators for putting Woo! together a wonderful panel. Uh, my name is CJ James. Uh, you could find me on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook at it's I A M A M C J J R. Uh, something motivational, uh, don't take no for an answer. And if you get a no, find a way to get a yes. Thank you guys so much again. From Nan, Youth Huddle, let's just give them one more big round of applause. So again, I'm Khalil Anderson and I'm a state legislator representing parts of Queens here in New York City. And I guess something motivational will be that in 2020, you all elected me 
to be the youngest African American ever elected to the state legislature here in New York. And, and those victories are not lighthearted victories, those are shared victories. And so, uh, just like my brother, uh, James, brother Clement James said, and the sister on the right said, it's important that we, don't, we stay out of our own way and that we make space for each other and we make shared victories a normal, a normality. When we talk about winning, it's not my victory being the youngest, it's our victory because now those struggles, those people who have not been heard, those young people whose voices have been left behind and forgotten about, come with me to the state's capital, come with me to Albany, come with me as I'm legislating, come with me as I'm activating our community and our neighbors. And so that's really important. Uh, and so it is my hope that today, if you hadn't gotten anything else out of this panel, that you got out of it the importance of us staying focused, staying uh, steadfast, and not waiting for the next moment to activate, but always being active. Uh, you all can follow me at, on my official government page, at Khalil Anderson, uh, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or X, rather. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and thank you again. My name is Christian Hall, um, firefighter, EMT, part of NAN Youth Huddle, also, um, Pre also, former Board of Education Vice President, became the youngest elected official in my city at the age of 24. Come on. I just want to encourage you to have less excuses and more solutions for yourself. Less excuses and more solutions. The next time you come, because I hope that you do come to another NAN convention or another NAN event, bring somebody with you. Encourage your kids to come out. You can, find, you can follow me on Instagram, I-T-S-M-E underscore David in the number five. Thank you. I just uh, want to uh, say thank you to Dominique and Ashley for always doing a wonderful job for Nan and keeping the legacy. Um, everybody, before we end, um, this has been a thing, every panel's we end, don't bombard them right as they get off the, the stage. Can you guys just... As soon as this is done, go outside. Just meet in the lobby. Do not stop here. If not, we're going we gonna to get you. But stop in the lobby and get all this information from them in the lobby. Let them take their awesome. pictures, and you guys go to the lobby, okay? Thank you. Thank also, you. wait a minute. Audience, please do not get up. Panelists, I'm going to ask that you all stand so that y'all can take a picture. Dominique on this side, Tatiana on this side. Audience, sorry, remain baby. seated. Please do not move. Security, don't let nobody out this door. <laughs> Hold the door. I'm going to say like they told the door. Put a lock on the door. Ms. Vern is sitting right there. Let him get the picture. Get out the shot, Christian. And we're going to move. Let's go. Hold the door. All right, let's give our panelists a hand one more time. We're moving. The panel that we're getting ready to go into, it is going to be amazing, and it is not something that you want to miss. Fulivi, help them out before the folks go by. Okay, this panel that we're getting ready to have is about to be great, <laughs> and I'm going to um, introduce each person. Shh. I'm going to introduce uh, Usman, and he's going to bring up his panel. If we can get quiet in the room, I know we're transitioning. I need everybody to be quiet, please. This is what I'm telling you. Shh, David. Thank you. In the lobby, please. Nicest way we can say it. <laughs> All right, but now we have a great panel. And I want to say this panel was first created. This panel has been in the workings for a long time. Um, and the young people that helped to create it is um, Usman Diallo, who serves as the National Action Network Youth and College Division uh, Field Director. Let's give him a hand. And the, purpose, and the purpose of this panel is to speak on the state of black men. That is not something that you hear young people talking about every day. So for a young person to have it in their mind to bring young, to bring black men 
to this table. And each of these black men are different in their own way, in their own respect, in their own respective person, and they're gonna tell you who they are. And they are some amazing black men that are standing across this uh, wall here. Let's give them a hand for just standing. So as Usman is coming up, they're gonna go forth in this panel. I wanna thank you all for joining us. This panel is gonna be about an hour, and then from here we're gonna transition back into the main ballroom for the talent show, all right? All right, y'all give Usman a hand one more time. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Christian. No justice? No justice? No uh, So this panel came about uh, by me, Felivi, and JT. Uh, we saw that, you know, there's an attack on black people, but there's an attack on black men. And our young people need people to look up. Our young people need people to look up to so they can be something, so they know what's good and what's bad and how to be better. So the only way we can do that if we have um, people from the older generation, people who we consider OGs and respectable and credible so that they can help drop these gems on us. So I'll ask every single person who's a panelist, please walk by up here so we can uh, start this panel because the people are waiting. Give them a hand, please. Uh, so, uh, before we start, we're going to start by setting our intentions and stating the purpose of this panel. The purpose of this panel is to actively involve black men of various ages and backgrounds in identifying the primary concerns of our community and that's affecting black men in America and determining the most effective strategies for addressing them. To achieve this goal, we were ensured that there's a diverse representation upon this panel because this approach is crucial as it allows for a comprehensive understanding of the challenges faced by black men. By incorporating these perspectives, we can develop a more nuanced diagnosis of the issues and explore wider ranges of potential solutions. Furthermore, we will be discussing civic engagement, political engagement, voter disenfranchisement, the 2024 elections, and further political goals beyond that because our goals don't just go to 2024, it exceeds and goes beyond that as a people. So what I first want you all to do, please introduce yourselves, your names, your backgrounds, what you do, who you are, and what's your why for showing up today and contributing to this panel. We can start from the right and then bring it all down. Good afternoon, Dr. Dennis B. McKeezy, 30 years educator from school aid teacher, assistant principal, principal, executive director. Now I'm running an organization of principals across the nation that are really sitting, you know, really sitting forth or setting forth the agenda to make sure that we normalize giving kids equitable, you know, opportunities in education as well as community development. Hey y'all, I'm Mikel C. Clark. I am first and foremost a father, a husband, and I'm a writer. I published a book called Eyes on the Road uh, this time last year. It's about mindfulness. And as an overthinker, I do a lot of just thinking about what it's like to be the father of a black girl um, in this world that we are surviving. Peace. Peace and blessings, everyone. I'm Terrence Floyd, the brother of George Floyd. Um, I'm also the founder of my nonprofit organization, We Are Floyd. And um, my reason for being here is I'm a black man, so why not talk about it? Peace and blessings. My name is Styles P. I am a rapper, and I 
also a health advocate, owner of Juices for Life and Pharmacy for Life, and um, I'm here because I love y'all. Good afternoon. I didn't hear good afternoon back. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Ah, now we're talking, now we're talking. My name is Phil Tate. I'm a reporter with WABC Channel 7 Eyewitness News. I'm Brooklyn, born and bred. Um, I've come, grown up coming to conferences like the National Action Network, definitely happy for these spaces. Um, I have a community give back in Brooklyn called Dream Reach Inspire, which is all about showing young people all that they can become. Exposure is key and making sure that they have the keys to life. My wife showing up here today, I am a black man. I am one of not too many I see, see of myself in many spaces that I'm in. And all the time I'm continually trying to be around communities like this where I can be embraced and also where I can give back. Peace and blessings, family. Yes, indeed. May the peace, mercy, and blessings from the owner of all peace, mercy, and blessings be upon y'all. Y'all know my story. I'm one of the formerly known members of the Central Park Five, now known as the Exonerated Five, and now also known as the Councilman for the Ninth District. <laughs> So I'm here because y'all, 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 I'm one of y'all. I don't even want to say y'all voted for me, right? I'm here because, as I've been saying, those who have been close to the pain have to have a seat at the table. Mm. And who better than a person who's been in pain but who's been able to, by the grace of God, this is not me, but this is by the grace of God, my mind is intact, my body is intact. I'm, I'm taking some of the... Juices for Life, Pharmacy for Life stuff right now. Black Seed and all of that good stuff. Sour, sour Sap and Sea Moss. Y'all gotta get some. I'm telling y'all, this stuff is wonderful. <laughs> like, I'm, 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 it's real talk. We don't, we don't talk about health. You know what I'm saying? We don't talk about health. I get my packages. It's, it's worth it. I'm gonna just say that. But my why is because I don't want there ever to be another Central Park Five. They said never again. They said never again with the Scottsboro Boys. But yet we became the modern day Scottsboro Boys. And when I think about what's at stake, they want us to believe that we were an anomaly. I represent the microcosm of the macrocosm of people just like me. And I think that's why my story resonates so much, because people see themselves in me. So thank you for standing up. Thank you for being here. Thank you for showing up. We need this. Grace and peace all. My name is Billy Council, uh, entrepreneur, um, athletic, uh, former athletic director, uh, former college basketball coach, um, founder of the Council Him Foundation and uh, um, the founder of Sunday Dinner, which is a speak space for black men to come and conjugate to talk about issues that's plaguing us in our community. My why is because we stand on the shoulders of greatness and I'm here with my brothers on this panel right here to help change the narrative of what it is to be a black man growing up in our communities. Thank you. That was powerful. Thank you very much. Uh, now that we got the introductions out the way, housekeeping out the way, I want to ask, what, what's the pressing issue that you think is facing black men, not just black men in generality, but young black people too? What what you think the problem is? I started. I think one of the things that's plaguing our young men is we took away their voices. As older adults, as older colleagues, as older mentors, we stop listening to what they feel and how they feel. And we try to come in with our own, own antidote to solve their problems. So I think one of the things that we have to do is start turning back the times and listening because at one point, or every man that's in this room right here, there was a young black boy that was broken 
And what happened, our broken boys became broken men, and we forgot how to go back and get the, and, and heal the, the, the younger generation. So I think that's one of the things that we have to start doing is start listening and being a vessel for our young people. The one thing I see in these, uh, that's pressing on these young men is um, suffering in the silence. Because they, 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 I see certain ones, they, they join these gangs and they want to be in the streets because nobody's listening to them and they have other underlining issues where they may not have a father in the home or they may be being abused but they don't know how to talk about it. You know, and that's what I try to do. I try to see these, these fellas in, the, in, in my neighborhood and just stop them, whether they go into the store and just talk to them because you never know that could be, uh, be, they could be contemplating suicide, you know, because they're suffering, suffering in silence. And that's one, that's one of the main things that I see pressing on my young, my young brothers. Can I, can, I just, can I just add to that, you know, when I think about my upbringing, I think about primarily how as a young 15 year old, by the way, this is, in, in, on April 19th, 1989, it's gonna be 35 years since the Central Park Jogger case. Mm. I turned 50 this year. Wow. So this is, I was 15 when this first happened. <clears throat> what they wanted me to believe, really what they wanted me to accept was a definition of myself that my family, that my mother, that my father and my ancestors had not given me. And that definition was a definition that I was born a mistake. I want y'all to consider this. They want us to believe that we are born mistakes and there are no mistakes. Like when God created us, we were one of over four to 500 million options and we were chosen. When God said be, when God said kun to us, we were. And so we need to know that we were not born a mistake, that we were born on purpose, because if we believe that we are born mistakes, we move throughout our life as if we are mistakes. And by the time we realize that we have been digging in the wrong ditch, it's too late. Our young men do not, their minds are not fully developed according to science in the worst case until they're 27 years old. So we gotta have grace and mercy with our young people in particular. We can't be afraid. When they look at, the, when they look at me, when they look at the exonerated five, they be like, man, them dudes right there. We are just you. When they look at me, God is trying to teach you that what you believe was the impossible holds the words, I'm possible. So you're possible. Our young people need to know this. Like one of the things, like the gang life, the, 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 just the whole way that they have been, I'm trying to remember the word. It's about how they're educated. <clears throat> Isn't, that's not the word that they use, but I found a better word than just education. But the way we're educated causes us to see the picture and not see ourselves in it. And so when we're looking at history, we see, the, we see ourselves as not being valuable because we're not in the history picture. When we see anything, right now, right now, when folks left the room to get with the panelists that were just on the stage, when we leave the room and folks are gonna wanna take pictures with us, the very first thing you will do when you get home is look for yourself in that picture. Mm. Imagine when you don't see yourself in the history mm. of who you are. You got to believe through a Sankofa vision. Return and get it. You are great. There are no mistakes. You are the impossible. That's what that's about. I'm going to slide in next. Um, I'll add, I think a big issue I see facing young black boys today is exceptional expectations without exceptional support systems. Um, I think that everyone in here is, is going through it, being black and surviving, being black and trying to find peace, being black and just trying to make it 
in whatever way. And so we don't have the capacity to give the youth that we're around what they need. We don't have time and space and energy and resources to be able to show up and say, this is how it works. This is how you do it. Here's how you hold yourself accountable. It's how you take care of yourself. And so I think that there is just a lack of capacity across the board, across generations, for all sorts of black folks to be able to show up for themselves and for the younger folks that are around them. One of the things I would say, I'm oh, sorry. One of the things I would say, um, I would see weighing on a lot of young people is lack of hope, lack of vision. No fault of theirs, but lack of hope and a lack of vision. If we have a vision, we know where we're trying to get to. I know my mother, she didn't play games with me. My mother said, we have a goal at the end of the day. We want to make sure that we can get you through high school. We can get you to college. You're not going to be playing around on these streets. You're going to do what you need to do. So if we have a direction, and if we have a sense of direction on where we're trying to get to, as, as we've heard already, of who we are, of whose we are, then the way we look at ourselves, the way that we go out into the world will be completely different. You know, we could sit up here, we could talk about many of the uh, structures of this country, unfortunately, that have plagued black and brown communities when it comes to healthcare, when it comes um, to uh, employment, uh, when it comes to us being able to uh, get economic wealth. We know that uh, owning a home is a game changer even for generational wealth, but if we're looking at how communities of color where insurance rates are completely different to other communities. Right, so many times, brothers like me, we're all looking around trying to do this for the first time, and many times just have a straight up question mark. Right, and the question mark, it's not fault of ours, it's just a fault of unfortunately of the systems of this country. And many times I think if we don't have that vision, if we don't have that plan, then many times what happens, we become discouraged. Right, I think what happened in 2020, Terrence Floyd is a really great friend of mine in uh, the protest. I was working at News 12 and each and every day I identified very early on that yes, people were protesting for what happened to George Floyd and to Breonna Taylor and to Ahmaud Arbery, right? All these things that we saw them out there for each and every day. But another part of that as to why they were out there because many times people told me that they were sick and tired of the practices of this country that would not allow them to even get a leg up. Right, and people say, oh, we can pull ourselves up. Well, if you don't have a strap to pull yourself up, how do you expect to get there? <laughs> you know, I'll just jump in real quick. Represent representation matters. And I want people to understand that as, as dim, grim as it may seem at times for our black boys, I think all they have to do at times is look at people like us that's on this panel. I think oftentimes we, we focus so much on the things and the people that aren't doing right. You know, it's not often that you get a chance to be amongst people who've gone through some things and then look at what's happening across this nation and say, well, wait a minute, why isn't anybody sharing the great news about black history and black boys and black girls and, and things like that? You know, you know, people don't know, just even recently, there's a 13-year-old boy in Oklahoma City who graduated from junior college. Mm. Mm. Nobody talks about that because the algorithms of Instagram don't push that. There was a 15-year-old girl who graduated with her master's degree and she's 16 years old and she's the first black third grade teacher in New York in, in America. I want people to understand that what we gotta remember is that we have to begin to unite and marry human and artificial intelligence. We can't continue to just flick on social media and not think it's design, not designed for it to be what it is right now. It's designed to show us the side of Styles P that most people don't even know about. It's designed for them not to know that he cares about the community. It's designed for them not to know that he and all the other hip hop artists and everybody out here that's doing great things, it's not by chance or by circumstance that they are sitting here telling you that there's a problem in black America. If you look here on this panel right now, we're doing something about it, each and every one of us in our own right, but we're not getting that space to speak of it. So when you wanna start to move the agenda forward, Stop sharing certain things on Instagram and Facebook. Stop sharing the negativity that's happening on social media and start pushing and sharing those things that give us the true understanding of what blacks are doing in this country. 
I refuse as somebody who grew up not far from Styles P. I grew up in Mount Vernon, and I understood at that particular moment that I had a choice, and so did everybody else that was with me. We had a choice to make. I made a choice. I went and got my bachelor's, my master's, and my doctorate degree. Mm. I want to be the living example of young people to see what greatness looks like. <laughs> Listen, I'll say this one last thing. I'm not here to posture before people about my experiences or about my accomplishments. I'm here to let everybody know that there are great black men out here doing great things for the community, and I'm standing up as one of them today. Powerful. Now I say, the list is too long because you just heard six great minds give you six good reasons. There's a lot more reasons, but here's another thing that's against the young black man. As my brother was saying, it's the algorithm. Because what's against the young black man is him understanding the power of the black family. If you go on social media today, somehow they have pitted the black man against the black woman. We are all together. You can't make a black man without a black woman. You know what I mean? So I think the structure of the family and what the family is about has been taken from these young men. There's not enough examples, like my brother say, of them understanding, okay, we can't be against each other. Most likely, if you got here, you got here from a black man and a black woman. So we have to understand that we're in it together and we have to be examples for the young fellas to say, you know, that's your queen right there. You're a king. Together, you're either going to make a prince or a princess, and your family is royalty. So that's what the black community is missing as young people. We've, we've focused on money too much and what the white man is doing. And no disrespect to the white man or what they're doing, but what black people do runs the world. And I think we forget that. I think we forget the soul of what black people is about. And now they got us in some kind of rat race, and it doesn't have to be like that. We have to make sure our young men and young queens know they're not pitted against each other, that we're all in it together. And I think uh, it's a lot more issues, but we're here covering them. No doubt. <laughs> we have a panel going on today, y'all. Uh, give them a round of applause again, please. I want to touch on what you just said. With times changing, people think that responsibilities are, is also changing. So how do we as black men show up in the community, show up for our families, and then how do we use that towards nation building and coming together and coalescing as a community? My answer would be learn how to take care of yourself first. That's something else that ain't teach us in the community. As black men, you always have a pressure on you that you can't cry, you can't be upset, you can't be soft, you can't, you can't do this, and then things weigh down on your mental and you don't know how to express yourself or handle yourself. Uh, now you're looking at black women who make more money than you. Now you're feeling like if you don't have a certain amount of dollars, you're not, you're not relevant. So the first part is taking care of yourself. Once you learn to do that, then you take care of your significant other, your immediate household, then your, your, your friends, then your community. And I think if we wake up thinking in that order every day, Things gradually advance. And then on top of that, to know that we don't own the media. That we don't own the media. So there's a lot of great black men, a lot of great black women, a lot of great black families that you don't get to see. Because as my brother was saying, the algorithm is set for you to think we're behind the eight ball all the time. It may be 60-40, but our 40 is very powerful. And our 40 runs the world. And without us running the world, if it ain't no black folks, the food's going to be horrible. <laughs> ain't going to be no dancing. Ain't going to be no singing. Ain't going to be no joyous good times. Like, we are powerful people. And I think we got to take notion of that. Wake up. Own that, own that you're a king. Like, one thing I see, I'm, I'm from a community. A lot of us address each other nowadays as kings. My brother. Nigga ain't so as popular as it used to be. And that's the thing they ain't saying. Nigga ain't as popular. Ain't nobody really too often going, what up, my nigga? Now it's, what up, brother? What's up, king? What's up, beloved? And these are things we need to highlight and keep going on, you know? 
<laughs> you know, and taken from what Styles is saying. You know, one of the things, one of the things we just simply got to do is just get out there and do it. Go out there and be it. Go out there and look like it. You see, there is this mindset that, again, that we have to be controlled by what happens on social media. The thing is, all we got to do is look in our community. Not everybody's out there selling drugs. Not everybody's out there doing the wrong thing. And I need everybody in here who's been on this earth more than a couple of years to be able to say, you know what? Congratulations, my brother. Congratulations, my king. Congratulations, my queen. Everything that's happening in our communities is as a result of what we allow for them to tell is happening in our community. Let, let me, let me, you know, something that Styles just said that was so important, you know, I'm good, you know, I'm really close friends with Dame Dash and Dame, Dame has just started his own, his own network called uh, America New. And one of the things that people don't talk about when we say, you know, Styles was saying is that we don't have our own network. Go and check what Dame Dash is doing. The Dame Dash, not the Dame Dash they show on social media, the Dame Dash who he and I was out in Chicago yesterday Fighting for the, the fighting for the kids that are locked up in prison that are living in deplorable conditions. That Dame Dash. We're talking about the Styles P who worries not only about what happens in hip hop, but happens in the community when we're talking about juices for life. I want people to really understand that the importance of just getting out in the community and just being who they are and allowing people to understand that guess what? When it's when it's all said and done, it's not who they say we are. It's who we say we are. Right. So however we plan to address ourselves is how they're going to continue to address us. If you want to keep calling each other the N-word, they're going to start getting comfortable calling you the N-word. When you're in a community where you start calling each other kings and queens, eventually they ain't got no choice but to be conscious enough to say the same thing because they know you don't even fit in this conversation no more. So as I, again, I think about this thing from an educational perspective. For 30 years, I've watched a lot of great things happen in education. They oftentimes say there isn't enough black men and not black people in education. And I'm saying, well, wait a minute. If I have to be there and I have to grab the other brothers that I got from across the nation and I put them in this room, there's, there's enough black men, edu male educators in this country that can make a huge difference. But guess what? It's never going to be shown on social media. So what I will tell you is that the numbers that they say is not really the numbers that they say. As Styles said, it's 60 40. Listen, they'll make you believe it's 90 10. You got a brother right there. You see that brother right there in the front? That's an assistant principal right there. That brother right there. I know him personally. A black male as an assistant principal. Stand but you up, wouldn't brother. know Stand that. Up. Stand up, brother. Stand up, Carl. This brother right there is an assistant principal right here in the Bronx. And I'm, and I'm highlighting that because we oftentimes get told who we are. And many times we actually start to believe it. I stand up here with some powerful brothers, man. I mean, we could go on tour together, you know, and really let the world know what's going on. Because this is not just here. We didn't come up here. We didn't come up here to posture and to tell you how great we are. We came here because we wanted to make a difference. And I stand here as somebody who says, listen, anything that needs to be done to help our black boys understand their potential, count me in 110%. All right, all right, with this question, I'm gonna have to put the dad hat on. Um, <laughs> foundation begins at home. As a, as a black man, I have three children. Um, I uh, teach them how to be their kings, and I have two kings and one queen, you know, and um, I make them feel special. I make them understand that they can communicate with me. Because if, I, if, I if you don't do these things at home with your own children and go outside and try to talk to the young people out there, you look like a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. You know, because you'll be talking to them outside and they see your kid, they see your child over there doing something and they look at you like, what are you, so why are you talking to me? You need to talk to him. You know, so that's why I start at home. You know, my son is a certified technician, I mean electrician at 21 years old. You know, um, my, my two youngest, they, they, they too young to understand things, but they still doing their thing. They still know they could come home and talk to daddy. Mm -hmm. They can ask me questions. And they know if the teacher say something and they don't understand it, they'll ask me. 
Now I'm not gonna go against I'm not gonna go against the teacher, but I'm gonna tell you the real. And then when they go back to the teacher and tell them, they're not gonna press me because they said my daddy said. And that's why you, you have to give them the confidence. That's what it is. You have to teach them the confidence because a lot of these young brothers and sisters out here don't have the confidence, the self-esteem, mm -hmm. the the. They don't even have goals. You know, you have to really teach that to them and, and, and explain it to them and let them explain themselves to you, themselves to you. And you have to listen. And that's how they relate to you, by you listening. And that's how I feel we're going to change our community. Let me, let me add this in there. <clears throat> we, have a digital, we have digital influencers here. We have uh, news anchors here. We have storytellers here. How do we reclaim that narrative? Where do we enter the system in reclaiming that narrative? And like you said, the brother said on the other end, Dame Dash is creating his own network. And should that be the platform we should use going now on to reshape and reclaim our narratives? I think we need more um, African Americans at the helm. We need more African Americans at the table, more African Americans who can better, uh, dictate might be the wrong word to use, but to better steer the conversation in the right direction. Um, I think we need to get rid of this um, idea black men um, are not here, black men are not showing up, right? Because we can go to Crown Heights, we can go to Bed-Stuy, we can go to the Bronx, and I can find a lot of black men that have showed up for my generation and also young people who are also doing great things for those who are to come. How do we show up even with the roles that we're in? It's with the stories that we choose to tell. It's making sure that we're uncovering stories that might have been passed off and going to our those who are in positions of power to say, I think that there's a story here. Let's go talk to some teachers in Brooklyn about the power of black representation in the classroom. Let's go to hospitals and let's talk about healthcare rates and why access and opportunity isn't where it's supposed to be. Let's go to the colleges and let's talk about why certain statistics might show that young black men aren't enrolling in college. And then let's talk about why it's so hard for them to get there. So when we talk about getting that narrative back, right, it starts with us. It starts with us doing the extra legwork to make sure that we're all on this mission together and that we all play a specific part. And it doesn't matter whether you are at the top of the totem pole, if someone would say that's where you are, or if you might have a, a position that someone might think isn't of importance. We all play a specific part. My mother would tell me that when I go out of her house that I represented her. It was the way that I spoke to people. It was the way that I dressed. She said that was a form of good manners. But if we learn that basis, then when we get into these positions, it won't be so hard. Facts, King. I want to say you worded that wrong, because it's how do we continue to reclaim it, because you, look at you, you set this panel up. Mm -hmm. Look at the room, young man. You set this panel up. You called the OGs here. So it's already happening. It's how do we make it continue to happen, because you're a young king that set up something great for his community. So I think often as black people, we don't pat ourselves on the back enough. And we listen to what everybody else is saying to us, and, and we act like we're not doing anything right. You set up something beautiful. You set this panel up. You're a young black man. We're all, 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 all seven gentlemen are older than you. But you had the sense, the knowledge, the compassion, and the care for your community to get these people here today to have us talking. So it's not how do we reclaim it is how do we continue to reclaim it and then promote that and get that out to our people because Thank you. Thank you. Wait, you see, I'm learning in real time. That's what the piano is for. Learning, learning. So I could take this information and go give it back to my peers and people in my community. So thank you for that. Yes, sir. Anybody else want to tackle the question? You know, I just want to chime in real quick because that's, that's so powerful. That's so powerful. I, I'm, I was looking for something and it caused me to realized that what I had said earlier today in my book of poems is so relevant to the narratives that we tell ourselves. Because we, let me just read this real quick. I, I said this before whoever was here in the room, I said, you know, I wrote this when I was in prison. And in the, in the most, in the times where I was the strongest, I wrote. And when the times when I was the weakest, 
I reached for what I wrote to resuscitate the life that was still here. Mm. This is called Heartbeat. We are at war, the bulk of which will not be physical, the bulk of which is mental. Psychological warfare to make me accept you as better, like your ice is cooler or water wetter. They're holding court in the streets. This time court will be sweet. We will not accept defeat. The signal will be your heartbeat. And I say that because when we think about, oh man, <laughs> humble, humble, humble. <laughs> but when we think about the narratives, we come from, a, I mean, we know this. We know, like, we know this. We know that, it's, that his story is whose story? Mm. The narrative that we are being fed is whose narrative? So the trick of this is this, and this is like so beautiful because even the part about schooling, my mother, before I got arrested for a crime I didn't commit, in a community that we're taught you're gonna be dead or in jail before you reach the age of 21, my mother had a parallel education going on in my home. Yeah, we went to school, but when we came home, we was reading about Grecian art, we was reading about Phoenicians, we was reading about the real Egyptians, we was reading about Africa, we was reading about the history of who we are. So that whenever, whenever they felt like they were gonna put their hands on me and try to arrest my development, guess what kicked in? The memory that, I, that my mother put there. And what added to that was the fact that my grandmother, God bless her, she's not here with us, my grandmother used to write me when I was in prison and I had to do the knowledge on this. I said, she wrote me letters that I always got. Our letters are molested. They're read before we got them. They're always open. The letters, I always got these letters and guess who they were addressed to? Master Yusuf Salam. I'm in the prison and the guards had to read. This letter is to Master Yusuf Salam. They sent it to me. My grandmother was telling them who I was. And my grandmother was reminding me when I read those words, whose I was. Right. And so we gotta do the, we, like, we gotta do the knowledge again. This stuff is here and it's, it's already been, we've already been blessed with it. What they have been doing is trying to disconnect the dioxyribonucleic acid running in our veins, that thing called DNA. They want us to forget. They want us to believe that there's greener grass on a whole different side. We are the grass. The very essence of who we are is the why we're here. And that's the part that has to never be taken for granted as well. That part. It's funny because, you know, the questions I tailored was just like this. And it was like, God plans and man, man plans and God laughs, you know? And I'm happy that I was able to walk in God's divine intentions for me and tailor these specific questions like this. And the next question I have is mental health. Uh, we spoke about not just mental health, but physical health, mental health, because the panelists, y'all all spoke a lot about health. So where do we implement that in our community, especially on the mental health part, we destigmatize it because a lot of us, when we hear mental health, that's like a foreign word to us. And how do we combat that stigma and how do we better speak about it? So it's interesting. I'm gonna say two things, right? When we talk about mental health, sometimes it's a cliche. And then we use mental health sometimes as an excuse. So a quick story. Growing up in Harlem, I wound up getting shot six times. And I had to learn how to eat, use a bathroom, walk, Man. talk. Man. All of that stuff I did in rehab, but I never dealt with my mental health. Mm -hmm. So when I say a broken boy became a broken man, 
I'm that little broken boy who's still broken because I still haven't repaired my trauma. Mm. Mm. So when that mental health aspect kicks in with our young people, oh, we got a lot of work to do, right? And we have to look at the healthcare system. We have to see how they deem black people when it comes down to mental health. We've been dealing with mental health since the 1800s during slavery. And we still fighting that. So in our community, when they sit there and say that black folks have mental health issues, now nah, we have life issues between that mental health stuff. So let's take that back a little bit. Right, so one of the things that we have to deal with we have to do is recognize that it exists within us. So I created this speak space called Sunday Dinner. And it's spelled son because everyone at that dinner is a son. And when we having those conversations, we have men in there crying because they don't know how to deal with it. Because they can't go to their wives. They can't go to their brothers. They can't go to their mothers and talk about it because we are left to be strong black men. But nah, we gotta be who we are. We have to be allowed to be weak and vulnerable. That's right. That's right. That's right. So we can sit up here and on this stage and all seven of my brothers, we deal with something. And when that mental health thing crisis kick in for us, first thing they say is we crazy. Yeah. Nah, we ain't crazy, we just sick and tired. Mm. No doubt. Mm. So, when I listen to Dr. Salam and Dr. Dennis, friends, one of the things that I know is that the fight in our community when it comes down to mental health is serious. It's serious. So when we talk about COVID, nah, man, we, we, we were kind of in trouble before COVID. So, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say this to each and every one of us in here, man, woman, child, deal with yourself first. Give yourself grace, and give yourself gratitude. Thank That's you. what's up, Billy. You know, Bill, what's, what's so dope about that is that the, the, the answer to the question is really about being willing to go through your own therapy, getting counsel, being able to pull up on your brothers and check on them as well. You know, what, what, what we've been taught in many of our communities is that, again, if you go seek therapy, you crazy. One of the things I didn't realize is that I just turned 50, and that was my first time ever being and seeing a therapist. Not for any particular reason other than the fact I just wanted to know why my mind worked the way it does. I just wanted to know that. And then I realized more than anything else, brothers keep a lot inside. We are really great actors of what happens in this world. Trust and believe that we out here hurting. We struggling, but you know what? We put on our face, man, and we, we put on our mask, and we get outside and do what we got to do. And I'm saying ain't nothing wrong with that. But what we got to remember, too, is go seek some therapy. Go seek therapy. And encourage our young brothers to do the same thing, too. Like, there's nothing wrong. Listen, guess what? If we don't encourage them to go do it, somebody else will. We don't want them to go on somebody else's merit. We don't want them to go on somebody else's thoughts about them. We want them to go voluntarily before they end up shooting somebody. Before they kill themselves. We want them to do that before. We want them to seek counsel and therapy before. And each and every person in here who has a child, who has a child, it is encouraging. It is encouraging to me to tell you, listen, that was the best decision I made in 50 years of my life is to start to go to therapy. Mm. And I want y'all to know that. If y'all are not, if you don't walk away with nothing else when we come to this mental health issue, Again, we all jacked up, and we've been jacked up for a long time. <laughs> and oftentimes, we didn't speak to somebody until they told us to go speak to somebody. Yo, let's do this thing voluntarily, y'all. There's a lot of good people out here. 
that are just stressed out. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So let's continue to encourage our young people to go seek therapy well before they hit that, that brick wall. Thank you. Wow. Well, what I do is um, I definitely go, like I said, I go around in the community and speak to these young men and young women. You know, I partner with my sister, Tani, with her organization, um, Steps with Sisters, where they deal with mental health with the women, especially, but also the men. And um, like I said, going back to what I said before, foundation begins at home. Growing up, my mother, you know, growing up in Brooklyn, my mother uh, had this thing, well, not a thing, it was like a session where she gave me one hour to tell the truth. <laughs> that was a that's long time. That's <laughs> oh my God. I need all that hour, too. <laughs> she said one hour to tell the truth. You don't have to worry about no belt, no switch, no nothing. <laughs> Man, that was good. <laughs> and when I got when I got all of that out, she said, "How do you feel?" And I said, "Oh man, I feel lighter." She said, "That's the power of telling the truth." That's where my therapy and my mental health started. Cuz I grew up, you know, I want to say sickly, but I was in the hospital a few times and, and back and forth in the hospital and, and going through certain things. So my childhood, I really couldn't you know, play football and stuff like that, so I was wondering why. So my mother always had to encourage me. That's the reason, I think that's, that's probably the main reason why I'm the father I am today, because I have to focus on my children. I have to make sure they're good. So I, I, now I implement that honesty hour with my children and they take full advantage. <laughs> oh man, I think they got more issues than I had. But, <laughs> but um, now my, my organization, We Are Floyd, um, I wasn't gonna talk about it yet, but I'm gonna talk about it. I'm trying to go into schools and implement the honesty hour. Now I told, now I, I did say, this ain't, this ain't no snitching session, this ain't nothing to be telling me, oh, I got this body, I got that, no, 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 no. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> no, you know what I mean? But um, just come in and express yourself. Let me know how your day was. Let me know what's on your mind. If you don't feel like talking about it, let's just sit and chill. I don't really, I'm not really a gamer, but I'll let you kick my butt just so you can feel good. You know, stuff like that, for that hour. And <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's basically how I, I'm choosing to attack mental health in my community. Yo. I think that we have to continue to validate spaces that have also been very powerful for black men. The basketball court, the barbershop, right? You put some black men in the barbershop, you're gonna, it's gonna be a good conversation, some drinks might come on out. <laughs> that for me is my weekly therapy when I go to get a cut, right? It's like all of my, that's fill time. That's fill time to just sit back, kick and relax, all the pressures of the world. I can just really just be me, just chill out and have that time. But furthermore, even upon that, I think that we also need to validate uh, mental health spaces in our communities, realizing that this is a serious, serious issue and we are not far-fetched from it, right? We've seen many efforts that our city has taken, various pilot programs. Unfortunately, we've also seen those who have had mental health issues that have unfortunately died at the hands of police. 
because those certain practices may not have been put into place. And we're not just talking about the administration that we currently see in office, but this is going back to previous administrations as well. And it's a, it's a serious issue, and I, and I say that because, you know, just a, about a month ago, I was in a courtroom and I had seen someone sentence, sentenced to 25 plus years to life. And on the way back to the station, it had really bothered me. Like, yes, this person had done wrong. And I said to my um, photographer, I said to them, you know, I wonder what were their warning signs? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it really, about for 25 minutes, I just went on this long rant. And I said to myself, are we paying attention to each other? Are we paying attention to our warning signs? Mm -hmm. When we see something that's going on with someone that we love, do we tell them? Do we go past the step of that person, it's their life and it's their decision? Sometimes we could be in so much pain that it's hard for us to make those decisions for ourselves. So I would just urge each other that many times when we see something, when we might start to see the first inklings or the first missteps of a bigger situation, let's speak up then. Let's not wait till we're in a poor situation where some bad decisions are irreversible and our lives are completely destroyed. Powerful, brother. I love, I love everything being said right now. And um, if I could just add, I think what I'm thinking about right now is how my bad day impacts your bad day. If I'm grumpy, if I'm sleepy, if I'm tired, you're also grumpy, sleepy, or tired. And we interact and we escalate for, for no real reason. Mm -hmm. That can change lives, that mm -hmm. can shape days and make everything worse for no reason whatsoever. Um, I'm autistic. I'm neurodivergent. A lot of folks in here are neurodivergent in different ways, which means that our brains are reacting to similar things in very different ways. So sometimes what might feel like a threat or a slight or an insult or a violation of some sort is probably somebody doing their best. And so what I try to do is pause and assume, I'm assuming you're doing your best. Yeah. I'll try to do my best. And if we can meet in the middle somewhere and de-escalate and find peace and find love, that can change the course of two days. We're in better moods. We change the course of four more days. Um, kids see us interact. Again, more things happen. They have better role models during those days. And so thinking about that ripple effect, I think is really powerful. And if we can all do that every day, it's a, it's a really different world. True indeed. Yes, King. That's powerful and that's very true. I think as uh, people of color, we have to always remember our mental wellness is attached to our physical wellness and spiritual wellness. We keep putting it more like it's in a separate pot. And uh, I'll give you an example. I've lost a daughter to suicide. Any given day, I don't know how I'm exactly going to feel. But then I'm going to give you another example. I have Master Yusuf right here to my left of me. I have Mr. Floyd to my right of me. Think about what they've been through. Think, think about what Master Yusuf had to go through in his life. Think about what Mr. Floyd had to watch his, with his family on TV. What kept them strong? The spirit. And going, the spirit, my spiritual wellness is going to keep me ticking. I'm going to stand tall. I'm going to let my body feel the pain. I'm going to cry. I'm going to yell. I'm going to scream. I'm going to get it out. Then I'm going to realize there's other people that or in the same amount of pain, or more pain than I am. And then I'm going to realize that's going around, and then that's going to make my spirit stronger. And as my brother said, I'm going to be mindful of the energy that I'm bringing to someone else. Because once you're mindful of how your spirit is, think about it. Go on social media today. Somebody, they, they don't even know somebody, and they're talking negative to them. You know why? Their spirit's not feeling well. So they want to bring somebody down with them. So I think if we start making sure we understand that all three are tied together and then look at other people who have been through tragedies and came out of it, and that's going to make us all triumph. And then check on your people because we, we have the tendency to say, how you feeling? If he start complaining too much or she start complaining too much, oh, no, nah, I don't, don't want to hear this from this person. But be genuine with your intentions when you're asking somebody how they feel. Be genuine with, with if it is the wrong way that you have a kind word or a good word, or maybe just a hug. And I think that'll make the world a bloody place for us brown folks.
before last question, but before we end off, you know, a lot of these issues that's plaguing us, it's not just something that we did to ourselves. It, there's public policy that goes into how we uh, get these resources or how we don't get these resources. And we have former city council candidate up here, Billy Council. We have current city councilman, uh, actually my city councilman, Yusuf Salam, up here. And so I want to ask them two first, what's the importance of politics? Or actually, what is politics first? And how should we engage with politics? So before I answer that question, do you know that only 20% of our community come out to vote in local elections? Right? Where the change begins. Right? So let's just use this. When I ran for city council in Harlem, there's 160,000 people who can register to vote in District 9. The winner only got 4,800 4, votes. Wow. Right? That's, so let's, let's start looking at those numbers, right? So the question when you ask about what is politics, I'll take it further back and I'll say, why are we not civically engaged like we're supposed to be civically engaged? So we can't talk about change if we don't show up to the table. We can't talk about change if we're not engaged. If we can't talk about change, if we don't even know who's running, right? So these are some of the things that we have to do when we start talking about politics, right? We got to start really finding w w what the real answer is, right? We need to, and I think it's in 1964 when the Civil Rights Movement and everything was going on, we stood tall to get voting rights so we can have someone at that table fighting for us. But it seemed like we going backwards. Because now we don't show up, so nobody won't fight for us. So when we start talking about gentrification, we're talking about all of these box franchises coming into our communities, let's start looking at ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we have to start changing the narrative of what it is to be civically engaged into politics. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of want to say what he said. <laughs> you know, I, so, I did this earlier, and I just read the 13th Amendment. And I read this in prison. I didn't know this existed. I didn't know. 13th Amendment, Section 1. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States of America or any place subject to its jurisdiction except for the punishment of a crime. I was like, what? <laughs> slavery is alive, I used to say and well, but then an elder said no, slavery is alive and sick. Mm. And then I realized when I read, when I, when, yes sir, when I, when I wrote my first published book, Punching the Air, I put this in the book, and then I read the whole amendment, and I didn't realize that section two told the whole story. Section two says, Congress shall have the power to enforce this article through appropriate legislation. So politics for me, which is, which is why I always say I'm not a politician. I didn't study political science. I was run over by the spike rules of justice. Keith Wright, thank God, came down to where I was living at the time and said, Yousef, you are our modern day Nelson Mandela. We need you. And that's why I came back. Because see, New York City for me was the scene of the crime. Mm. I didn't want to be around, I could, I could tolerate it for a bit. But when he told me that and I realized that everything that I had gone through, I had actually grown through for this very reason. So I had to come back with buckets of water. I had to come back to talk to my community about mental health. I had to talk about it from a different perspective because oftentimes, even when we're consuming things that may make us appear to be out of our minds, I was also taught that perhaps the person who's consuming the drugs might believe more than the person who says that they believe in God. Because every time they open their eyes, they're saying to themselves, this can't be life. Take another sip. Take another, take another. The problem is that 
we're oversaturated in our communities. So the panel I was on earlier, a young man said to me, can you talk about X, Y, and Z? And I said, well, do me a favor. I'm new to politics. Can you break it down in layman's term? And he did that. Politics is always this big, giant mountain. They do this. What are we looking for for services and support? Oh, it's this thing and that thing. Just break it down. Make people understand that what, what you just said about the vote, and how we show up, we think that non-participation is non-participation. Non-participation is participation. <laughs> because if you don't stand up for yourself, guess what? You're, think about the Miranda warnings, right? Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. What you don't say will be used against you in a court of law. And what they will do is Congress should have the power to enforce this article through the legislation that they put forth, and that legislation will be overwhelmingly meted out in the black and brown community. We will be looked over, we will be forgotten, but you know what the antidote to that is? Knowing the truth. Knowing that you are somebody. Knowing that you have value. Knowing that you have wealth. That inside of you is all of that which is and which could be. So we have to do the knowledge again and realize that we're right now inside of someone else's plan. Where's our plan? We plan for the weekend. Mm. 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 We, 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 if we're if we good about it, we got a five-year plan. I need us to plan in 50 to 100-year cycles. I want us to project ourselves into the future so that you look at yourself and say, what is my 50-year-old self going to look like at 15? So now I got to say, what's my 100-year-old self going to look like? I got to think about those who are not yet born. Because I have children. I have 10 children. You know? That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> Listen. Y'all ain't right. Y'all ain't right. Y'all know I'm a spiritual man. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> listen, the good book said be fruitful and multiply. Uh -huh. I was just playing my part. Y'all know I went to prison, though. But I'm just saying, no, but the, but, the, but the reality is this. Those children, my seven daughters, I have seven daughters and three sons. Those children, I have to be mindful of their children and their children and their children and we got to plan seven cycles out. Because let me tell you, those gains that we made, the fact that people stood in lines and, and, and decided that I'm going to cast my vote. We got folks in that are trying to make us believe that they just like us. God telling us, man, I'm just like you. I've been indicted. <laughs> selling, us, selling us gold sneakers. As if we can somehow click our heels if we put them on and transform our reality. These are trinkets. And so when we talk about the politics of it all, politics is, was always dirty for me. It was always politics. I'm going to take that because the brother said it in the audience. Why? Because guess what? That word came out of our community. Because people promised us the moon and they delivered the mud. So now what do we have to do? We got to make it count. We got to make sure that we're not dissuaded by the shiny objects that's trying to take the moment because we have to move in a manner that this is a movement and not a moment. We got, a, we got an opportunity here to shift and ripple into the future so that what we're doing right now, like it might not all change on my watch, right? But guess what? If we move it one step forward and we keep our eyes on the prize and those of us who are waylaid in the melee, forgive yourself and don't have a pity party. Don't remind yourself about the things that you may have done. Remember who you are now. You're not that person that you was.
Terrence, I also want you to touch on it, especially from a policy perspective, about you know your brother was killed in a demonic fashion. Mm -hmm. They need on his neck for close to nine minutes. And what Master Yusuf just spoke about, about turning moments into movements, how do we get that legislation, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, passed on a federal level so we can require that no one ever has to go through that again. And if they do, there will be fierce punishments for it. Hmm. Well, for one, keep having these conventions. Keep attending these conventions. Keep putting your input in. Uh, to me, politics is life. You know, uh, I, I often said it in interviews that when they asked me questions, I said, uh, without getting too political and stuff like that, but I had to realize what I'm talking about is political. That's right. <laughs> that was smooth. I like that. It's a hall of but you know, um, once, I, once I understood, to me, it was life. I looked at everything different as far as voting. Well, I always gonna vote, don't get me wrong. But as far as the voting, as far as the census in your neighborhoods, cause I, I'm gonna be honest with you. There were times I used, to, I used to work and the census come and I'd be like, I'd do everything in the last minute. But once I realized the importance of a census in the neighborhood, that's why we don't get the resources we need because a lot of people don't fill them out. They don't even know the, the, percentage, the percentage of the people that they say is in the neighborhood is off. That's right. Because we're not filling out those senses. You know, um, they, you're thinking everybody won't be in your business, the FBI, the, it's just every, the narrative of everything is just, just off. But you gotta understand the politics is life. And if you want a better life, get into the politics and make it better. I would also say that I think it's really important that we show up to the polls when we have these elections. It's not when we just have our presidential election when all eyes are on who's going to the White House, right? But it's who's sitting inside City Hall, who was our, who's our assembly members, who are representing our direct communities. And the reason why I say that also is because they are the ones who determine whose streets get repaved, whose money is going to after schools, who's getting those contracts, right? All of that is really determined by us going out to the polls. More or less also as well, sometimes we don't understand the power of something until it's taken away. Because down south right now, how many pieces of legislation, I think it's over 30 something pieces of legislation that there are certain people in power who are trying to make it harder for black communities to get to the ballot box by not giving somebody a bottle of water while they're waiting online just to go vote. So we have to continually remind ourselves of the unfortunate things that continue to plague our communities for us giving access to vote. And we know that how powerful the black vote is when it comes to our elections. So even if we're up north, let's just remember and remind ourselves that even as we would go to vote, that there are those who would try to even take away our vote. Let's make sure that we are continuing to gather like we are in this room. Let's gather the same way to the ballot box to make sure that we're not complaining about the issues, but that we're being active towards them. I think one thing that I've realized is that politics does not impact all people in the same way. It impacts disenfranchised people the most, black people, women, queer people, trans people, et cetera. And so, I mean, we've seen it over the past 10 years in so many different ways. Um, it should be something that we all see as an urgent matter, more so than a lot of different groups of people. We are, you know, we're amongst ourselves in this, in this room, but most of America is white. <laughs> Most of America does not look like this room. Um, they have a different agenda. And even if we show up in humongous numbers, we will still be outnumbered in a lot of ways at the polls, at all sorts of things that revolve around politics. And so I think it is a very urgent matter for us to think about and prioritize, especially for these big moments.
I'm going to approach this in a different manner because I have an actual life. I think as a community, we have to learn to police ourselves and come up with policies that work for ourselves that then we bring to the politicians. I come from a gangster rap background. I don't know if some of y'all know I've said some of the hardest things in the history of <laughs> saying hard things. But then I also realize what needs to be done in my community. And instead of going to ask politely, I demanded politely. I, because the politicians need you. You have power. Right. We have to have the political power in our own community to say this needs to be in our community. And if somebody's scared to lose a seat, lose a vote, lose a position, and there's enough of us together, they're going to listen. They're going to listen. They have no choice. So I've been able, just last week, I was standing side by side by the mayor. I remember 2018 going to City Hall, walking myself up in City Hall and going, we're going to have to redo these parks. We're going to have to put workout stations. You know, eventually we're going to have to do some farming, some growing. Nine parks in. Nine parks in where I'm from for that, now. Please. Nine parks in. And it's not because I'm a, a, a powerful political person, because I understand the power of my community. Understanding the power of your community gets you to go, all right, if we all, if we was all from the same seven of us right here from the same district, and we go, all right, this is what, what, what we want to happen, this is what we don't want to happen, here's who we're going to address, and here's how we're going to go about it. We may lose, but we're going to look strong. And then we're going to win next time because you need a little uni unity. So we're talking about politics, but we're not talking about unity in the community first and wanting to see our community do better. When there's enough of us who really literally want to see our community do better, then run up on City Hall with what our issues are, there will right. be change. I don't want nobody to get mad at me, but before we end this, we're gonna have two young people uh, ask questions to the panel, and then we're gonna ask the panelists for five words of encouragement. Uh, they can give out resources that they may know of to help young people, black men, anybody in this room, and then we will end it because we have something going on in the next room. Thank you to my brothers and Nan Youth College for putting this amazing panel together. Uh, my name is Monet Smith, um, social entrepreneur, and nonprofit founder in Brooklyn that does youth and criminal justice work with kids in the city. Um, my question stems to something I was thinking during this panel, something that my pastor said recently, is that faith, which is a fear, which is a lack of faith stems from a lack of confidence in your abilities and a lack of self-esteem. And I think that economic self-esteem allowed us to our communities today to create our own cultural definitions of what success is, which we define success, and we kind of make the collard greens of a bad situation in defining successes. If I can reach the traditional American sense of economic success, our, defini our new defined definition of success is gang bang, our like street drill, or like different things like that. So I guess that itself, especially in the young community, as we age to more image bound society, what is your perspective on kind of tackling our community's redefined success, which kind of comes from street culture? Hmm. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> that was that was very powerful. She go re it, it, it very uh, so I can rephrase, sorry. Basically, um, how do we tackle the new modern generation's definition of success being street culture, which comes from, you know, us not being able to attain the traditional American sense? We change what street culture is about. And I think it, I think it's, it starts with that. Like being myself, as I said, I've for those who know me, I'm one of the most gangster rappers that has ever lived. I love it. Uh, but I'm here now. But I'm here now. So I think it's taking on where you come from, seeing yourself in a different light, and then being able to spread that message to other people. I think success in, a, in our community is understanding how soulful, how powerful we are, and then working on that. I also think success comes with, I didn't want to get on this, but how we eat and how we treat ourselves and how we treat our body. Because what we're basing things on is a lot of us have chemical imbalances that we don't check because as people of color, we have the most diabetes, we have the most high blood pressure, we have the worst heart rates, um, prenatal issues, 
things of this nature. So we're not taking care of our health, which means now we're looking at success from the wrong point of view. Now we're making success strictly financial. S financial success comes along with how you feel about yourself, what's good, what's going on with you, and the better you feel, the better chance you have at making a better decision. The better chance you have at having better ideas. Um, most of us come from neighborhoods that are food deserts. So instead of running to the McDonald's, no disrespect to McDonald's or whatever fast food place or the liquor store, now it's about saying, let me learn how to eat right, treat my people right, spread that message. That changes the trajectory of how the community looks at success. That comes from just having money and saying, I have money, I'm successful. We have to change that to I have a healthy black family. I got a roof over my head, I got food, I got a job. I'm successful, then you begin to flourish. So I think the street culture changes with all of us being unified and people who are not in the street culture, staying in contact with people who are in the street culture and then getting together and going, our people's culture is the most important culture. And I think we're doing that and we just have to continue to keep doing that. And, Thank you. Good job. Thank you. And, and, and listen, you, you, we, we got to give it up for Monet in that question, man. She had the best question of the day. Let's give it up for our sis. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the other thing you could do really quick is to think about it this way, is that you all are the future. You all can define what success looks like for the future now. Right, you don't have to do you don't have to do it the way we did it. We don't you don't have to look at success from the same perspective we did. It's what you all are gonna say it is, and that's what this whole organization is about. This is what, what y'all are doing today is all about, is that you all create the new narrative of what success look like, what it sounds like, what it feels like, what it smells like. It's on you guys now. Like do, don't uh, listen, some of us I mean Styles said it, like some of us have done some things back back then that y'all don't wanna actually emulate the stuff that was done. <laughs> You all have a unique opportunity to create that idea of what success looks like and be able to pluck the greatness which is in our community and say, that's how we judge success nowadays. Nobody don't need to, no one needs to define it for you all anymore. It's on you guys now. And we just here to support. Thank we you. here to be the voice for you all, but you all actually are the ones who are gonna define what success really Thank is. You. First and foremost, first and foremost, I'm gonna say this. Um, they called us the OGs, okay? So our our street culture is way different than y'all. Way different. You know, and right now, I just want to say real quick, get off of demon time and get on God's time. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, for, my, for my last question, um, there's a saying in my village that when an elder passes away, a library is burned. But the second part of that quote is that it's on the community to make sure those books in those libraries gets to a new book. And so the, what I want to ask is, and I don't need a page from a book, just a couple lines from your book, if there, to the young people, young black men, if there's just a quote, a rap lyric, whatever, something short and simple, what would you tell them for them to move on into their life, adult life? Well, maybe maybe I'll I'll try to tackle it by giving you um, this is my signature poem. It's called "The Revolution Will Not Be Televised." The revolution will not be televised. I can remember when that statement made me sad inside, too young to be in it. Now I couldn't even see it. Why? Why couldn't the revolution be televised? The last poets, Gil Scott Heron. As I grew up, I began to see. They left theirs, and I too wanted to leave a mark on history. A man in half, and I wanted to bask in that task that set men free. But a revolution, the revolution, is where I knew I had to be. The revolution will not be televised. They didn't want to display the victory of those quote unquote lesser men. The revolution will not be televised. Smile, I know, because I am the revolution. And so, and so when young people read that poem, they're reading that they are the revolution. And I want them to know that. I want them to know that all of the things that will be is right in their hands. 
right? And the other thing, too, is don't be afraid. Fear. This is not me. This is not my words. Fear is false evidence appearing real. And once you conquer that fear, you realize, you're like, what, what was I afraid of? If it's in you to do it, do it. But you have to do it. And if you don't do it, we will be deprived of the great things that lies within you. Uh, now we're going to start from the left to the right. I need five words from all of the panelists, uh, something to leave uh, the co people at the convention with. So five words that go like this. I love beautiful black people, something like that. Just five words. It's me. Oh, um. <laughs> Brothers, unity, commitment, love, accountability. Echo, you are the revolution. Fortitude, strength, hope, courage, determination. Got me doing math now. Mm. <laughs> Hold on, it's my turn anyway. <laughs> you got time to count. <laughs> I love you dearly, my beloveds. Ooh. See, that's a rapper there, man. He, he already had his bars ready. <laughs> love. Set trends. Set tones. Be the change you want to see. <laughs> <laughs> you know. We'll take that as one word. That was one word. Want to see. All right. I'm proud to be black. Wow. That's how you end it. That's how you end it. That's a principle. <laughs> Come on now. Yes, Give him a round of applause. Uh, Give. Okay, before you all start moving, we're gonna do like the last time, security. <laughs> Hold the doors. They're going to take a picture, get close, act, okay. Act like you love each other. One minute. All right, so we are now going over to the main ballroom for the talent show and fashion show. We are getting ready to start, so hurry up and get your seats. They're gonna open up the doors. Thank you all for joining us on this wonderful convention. Give yourselves a hand as you're leaving the room. All right. Oh. <laughs> 